Okay, hello, fellow philosophs, and welcome to Knowing You Know Nothing. This is episode number 46. I've been excited about this one for a long time because I thought, man, I want to talk about another topic that I know nothing about because I cannot play a musical instrument, I cannot write music, but I find songwriting so fascinating that people are able to do this. I have two former students joining me for the podcast tonight that I've known that since high school even, they were always not only playing musical instruments, but also attempting at writing their own music. And I wanted to have them on because I could gain better perspective from that, and maybe some of our listeners could, could too. So I'm going to try to pull as much philosophy out of it as I can at understanding really why Maria and Jacqueline do what they do. So before we start, the podcast title, again, is Knowing You Know Nothing. This podcast title represents really my personal journey through philosophy. This title was inspired from the famous ancient Greek philosopher Socrates, In reference to Socrates, Plato stated, I am the wisest man alive, for I know one thing, and that is that I know nothing. While doing this podcast, I will have interesting conversations with interesting people in order to learn more about the world around me. Thank you for joining me for this time. And just to do a little bit of house cleaning before we get into our episode for the month of August, looking ahead, we're going to do our third roundtable discussion next week. And the topic this time will be, how should work be defined in the 21st century? And I wanted to say something about that question. People think that when you put 21st century in a question, they think it automatically has to be about technology and it has to be computer stuff. It doesn't have to be about that because the podcast is more about work and how has, I guess, the value of work changed and what does hard work look like and you know, people are going to college, not going to college, and really just as we go in throughout this century, because we're already almost a quarter of the way through the 21st century, which is crazy to think about. I, but, you know, this is one of those things where I, re- I really want to talk about it because it's something that, that means a lot to me and it's something my father instilled for me when I was younger. I think it's a conversation that would be great to have five or six people. Um, I think Nathan Davis is going to join me again for that. Uh, Wes Jones from the Real Talk Movie Podcast will be on. My twin brother, Ben, will be on that one. And other one of my former or my current co-host on the sports podcast, Kathy Chong from Chicago, is also going to be on that one. So I'm trying to get new people all the time. And who knows, maybe Maria and Jacqueline. They just felt like (laughs) coming on two weeks in a row. They're always welcome. Um, Another part of our news for our house cleaning, again, as I announced last week, we are now on Spotify. It took a while because I was lazy and I didn't actually do the RSS feed and actually put it on Spotify. I wish I would have because it seems like people really either have Apple Music or they have Spotify, but you can find Knowing You Know Nothing on there. Please go on there if you have time to do so and subscribe or follow the podcast. I would appreciate uh, any time that you spend or invest. Uh, another topic is our art. I have a new podcast logo that has my ugly face on it with a broken light bulb in the background that is also illuminated to enhance the whole part of uh, basically recognizing your ignorance but still wanting to gain enlightenment and wanting to gain knowledge. Last topic for the house cleaning is our next movie. So two weeks ago, we did No Country for Old Men, pretty dark look at a movie. But the movie that we're going to do next is going to probably make that movie look like a kid's movie. Because our next movie will be the first of my Stanley Kubrick series, A Clockwork Orange. And I don't know if either one of my guests ever heard of that movie before, but it is crazy. And it's also based off of a book. Again, I'm going to have independent movie critic Eric Harris who writes the blog, Why Do I Own This? He'll be on the show. But a new guest, I cannot wait to have him on the show. He has way too many followers to be on my podcast, that's for sure. But his name is David Becker. I heard him on the Real Talk Movie Podcast. He has a website called dvdinfatuation.com. He's also a co-host of Horror Movie Podcast or Horror Movie Cast and The Land of the Creeps, which is an amazing podcast name, uh, mainly focusing on horror films. But he is great. I think he has somewhere close to forty six to 50,000 followers. And I'm just like, geez, I can't even believe he answered my my message when I sent him one, but I appreciate having him on. So to have two movie critics on the next podcast, to do a movie and to try to do it justice with someone as famous as Kubrick is going to be a hell of a challenge, but I look forward to doing that. Without further ado, on to our show tonight, episode 46. I want to welcome my two guests in, Jacqueline and Maria. So Jacqueline Bachelor, welcome to the show, your first podcast ever. Yeah, thank you. I'm super excited. <laughs> Oh, I'm excited too. Again, it feels like it's been a long time since I've actually had a full conversation with you because it's been mm-hmm. so long now. It's been three or four years since you graduated oh, high yeah. school. And then Maria Wells, uh, you went Hi. through your first year of college sort of this year. 
until the you know COVID thing hit. But Maria, I think it's your first podcast. How does it feel to be on? I am kind of nervous. <laughs> <laughs> but listen- I'm excited. <laughs> Yeah, see, our listeners don't know, but Maria's nervous for two reasons. One, being on the podcast. Another reason, because there's a giant spider outside of her window near a web that at any point <laughs> in time could dangle down and she might dive away from the camera. So if you end up watching the YouTube version of this, you kind of understand why sometimes she keeps looking over to her left. Nobody's stalking or anything like that. It's just it's nothing to worry about. It's just a huge spider that's probably poisonous. It's no, no big deal <laughs> at all. But just to start the show, as both of these two individuals know, because they dealt with my annoyance as a teacher, and they know I like to ask weird questions. <laughs> but unlike myself, most of our listeners don't really know who Jacqueline and Maria are. So I think the best place to start at before we get into songwriting and what it means to both of you is getting to know what the foundation of each of you are and what makes you who you are and how would you describe yourself. So I'm just going to go by seniority. So Jacqueline Batcher, who is Jacqueline? <laughs> what a great question. So I am from Russellville, Kentucky. I had Mr. Malcolmson as a teacher. Um, I'm currently living in Nashville. So I go to Belmont University where I'm majoring in music business. Um, so it's a, basically a business degree, but focusing in the entertainment music industry. Um, but I've always loved music. So um, gradually just growing up, I kind of shifted over to songwriting, kind of figured out what I'm doing. But I now work in the industry, um, interning and doing the ins and outs of that. Um, so I really love it. Um, but yeah, I'm super excited. <laughs> I'm excited because I, I just now found out what your major was. So when I heard yeah. that was to be into that, that's really exciting. I'm definitely wanting to have you back later. I plan on doing a few episodes over just business in general. Mm -hmm. But one of the topics in philosophy that Maria knows I'm a huge fan of, which is moral philosophy. I love talking about right and wrong. And that falls under the category of ethics. And just out of curiosity, Jacqueline, because you're going to be a senior this year, have you had to take an ethics course, like a business ethics or anything like that? And what was that like? Yeah, I just took business ethics last semester, and then I also took Christian ethics. Um, So Belmont is a Christian school, so they have a lot of a big theology program. Um, So I took Christian ethics as an elective, and then I had business ethics um, just for a part of my major. That's awesome. That's a nice shameless Mm -hmm. tag for old Belmont University right there. Love Belmont. (laughs) It's good some free advertising for Mm -hmm. Belmont. Belmont is, you know, I actually didn't know that it was a Christian university, Mm -hmm. but that's great that now just out of curiosity i'm sorry maria i'm taking this away from your time for the who is maria wells part but <laughs> I, I just gotta ask while i have you on the topic so you did take business ethics and you mm-hmm. took christian ethics did you see a lot of similarity there or do they sometimes contradict one another i really didn't think so um not all business schools require an ethics course um and so i was really thankful that belmont did because i think business can be so competitive sometimes that people forget that there really is a need for ethics. And so I'm really thankful that Belmont taught us that. Um, So obviously they were different topics that we talked about in Christian ethics. It was more of a conversation. Like you would have loved that class because all we talked about is like how issues in society play out based on our faith. So it wasn't as much of like what's what Mm -hmm. the Bible says about certain things, but more, how does the Bible relate to 21st century now? Um, And so I really enjoyed it. Like it really made me deep, like dive deeper into what I believe and why, Um, and not based on what I've been taught and what other people think, but based on straight back to the scripture. And so it was really interesting. Um, So they're very different, but I wouldn't say they necessarily like contradict. Yeah. And that's awesome, Jack. I love how Mm -hmm. you're elaborating on that. And I don't know if before the podcast came on, when I told you this was a philosophy podcast, you Mm -hmm. might've thought, Oh my God, I've never really done philosophy before. (laughs) But it turns out you actually have, they don't Mm -hmm. call those classes philosophy, but that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think really, Jacqueline, you said it earlier, anything with competition in it, I think it needs some form of a ethics course with it because I mean I don't know a a ton of jobs we don't deal with other people in it Mm -hmm. but especially as something as competitive as the music industry uh, I just can't imagine what kind of ethical conundrums come up uh, throughout your experience I can't wait to have you you know five or ten years down the road after you've kind of gone Mm -hmm. into doing a different career to to have you on there but probably by that time Jack I'm going to ask somebody's permission to talk to you (laughs) at at that point I'm enjoying this moment now while I can can talk to Jacqueline like a like a normal person I have to talk to her 
or <laughs> kind of, uh, HR advisor to get oh her gosh. advice. But no, Jacqueline, thank you for giving me that insight. And, and like mm -hmm. I warned you already, depending on what you say, it gives me other ideas of things to ask. Yeah, no problem. A lot to do that. So <laughs> on to my second and last guest of the night um, is Maria Wells. So Maria, who is Maria Wells? Hi, that is my name, Maria Wells. I am from Lewisburg, Kentucky. I am going into my sophomore year at Western Kentucky University. I am majorly undeclared. Um, still figuring that out. So we'll get there. I'll let y'all. I'll let y'all know whenever I figure that out. I've always loved music ever since I was a kid. I've always been singing and humming and making up little tunes. Um, but I don't, I'm not sure if that is going to be my uh, main focus going into like a career path, but I definitely know I'll be doing it for the rest of my life. And hopefully if I can work that into my job someday or just helping other people with it, then that's definitely what I want to do. I'd say that that's no pun intended, but that's music to my ears to hear you <laughs> both imply that you still want this, no matter what road or route that you take in your life, you're going to want this to have still a major involvement in your life. And I didn't want to make this podcast out to the word. Either one of you were necessarily trying to seek some kind of a professional career in it if you didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. But I think that it can definitely be something that means a lot to you. And I think a, a great segue into that. And Maria, I'll start with you where you ended that. But, of course, I want Jacqueline's answer on this, too. So this is where the conversation just opens up. And you can ask me questions. You can ask each other questions. But I'll start with Maria just to kind of give us a nice start. I don't want you two fighting each other over who's going to answer <laughs> first. So the question is, how long have you been songwriting and uh, interested in writing songs in general? Okay. So uh, whenever I saw that question, whenever you kind of sent me that little outline, I, I got a little notebook out that I've had for a while because I wanted to see, because I date everything, and I wanted to see the earliest <laughs> date I could find. And there was some stuff in there that was like, wow, I can't believe like that came out of my brain like it's very bad <laughs> but it's because I was like 10 whenever I started writing and just making up random stuff and so the the farthest evidence that I have it was 2010 whenever I wrote a date on something and so I've been that's 10 years <laughs> half of my life well I'm 19 is that right no it's nine it's years yeah. it's been nine <laughs> years I was born in 2001 <laughs> and this isn't a math podcast we're okay <laughs> <laughs> yes nine yeah. years oh no i already messed up on my math <laughs> maria I, I, I got a curiosity because when you said you date things jacqueline also reiterated in chimed mm -hmm. in she does too uh I, jacqueline i still do want you to answer how long you've been into that but just out of curiosity why do you date these things what, what really influenced you to to want to keep things dated so much because i really don't know a lot of people that do that which is these normal things that they do mm-hmm you will find so many random loose leaf papers that have random scribbles on them and that make no sense, but I will put a date on it. And I think mostly it's because I, whenever I look back at it, if it has no context, if it doesn't have a date, then it doesn't have context. And so I'll see something, maybe just a few lines and I'm like, why did I write that? And then I'll think back and I'm like, oh, that was what I was like, that's what was happening in my life right now. I think mostly whenever I was young, I started dating things just because I wanted to know how old I was whenever I was writing these things. You'll like, if I'm looking at my notebook right now, which obviously you can't see, but <laughs> I'll like at the top of the paper, um, it'll say, uh, I, I, I wrote whenever I started it, uh, the, literally the time and then the time that I finished it, which was a couple days later at 1113 AM <laughs> and I was 13. <laughs> so <laughs> So I have, I don't know what's up with the details with that. I don't, what's your take on it, Jacqueline? Is it the same just to give yeah. you context? Yeah. So when I first started writing, I kind of did the same thing. There was like a little note on my iPod <laughs> where I just had all these random lines and did they mean anything? They didn't really have much meaning. They didn't really have any um, like melody to them. No music um, because I was like 13, 14, like hadn't finished a song. I wrote some poetry randomly um, but I always loved music. And so I was like, maybe one day I'll write this and it'll become a song. So I had it on my iPod. Um, and so those lines were never dated. I wish I was a little bit more meticulous about that because I think it's really interesting. Um, but after I wrote, I think my first or second song, I started dating it with the finished date. Um, partially kind of the same reasons that you said, but 
um, to know where my mind was. Like, what did I write this about? Most of the songs, I remember what I wrote it about because I like to tell stories and the memory behind it usually just comes back when I'm reading through it. Um, but also to see growth because um, one of my favorite quotes ever that I've heard about songwriting is actually from Ed Sheeran. He's phenomenally talented, but he said that songwriting is like an old faucet. Um, and when you turn it on, there's going to be dirty water that comes out of it. But the longer you have it running, the more clear the water becomes. And that was one of the most encouraging statements or quotes that I've ever heard about songwriting. Because when I started, I could get really discouraged because I'd turn on the radio and I was like, my stuff is nowhere near as good as this. And I just always felt like I wasn't good enough. Um, and then I heard that quote and I was like, you just kind of have to keep working at it. Um, so I like to see the growth. So I'll go back and like, I number my songs so that like, it's not as much dated. It'll have an end date on it, but it'll be like song number one <laughs> on this day. And then I, so I go all the way up so that I can go through and like, almost like my life story, if that makes sense. So, um, I wish I would be a little bit more of like when I started the song and when I ended it, because some songs I've written in a day and an hour, and then some songs it's taken me three months to finish. Um, mm -hmm. So I remember that a little bit, but I wish I had a little bit more specifics with that. So I might start doing that now. <laughs> well, I you sound, you sound much more meticulous than I am because I am, I'm so unorganized and I, I try mm -hmm. to pretend that I am, but <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm totally not. I have like five different journals that I'm probably using right now. Like one that I'll just carry with me in case something comes to my head and then like four by my bed because, you know, you need four by your bed, obviously. Yeah, <laughs> one by the piano, you know, yeah. they're just everywhere mm -hmm. and I, they're yeah. everywhere. <laughs> yeah, see, I actually write mostly on my phone. Mm -hmm. um, so I have like I was my just notes. About to ask that. Yeah. I know Maria's like, oh, has a big pile of notebooks. That she I also take. have a notebook. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I yeah. have both. I um, love it. Yeah, but like the process usually goes on my phone um, just because yeah. I change lyrics and I actually can't read music. Um, so when I write, I write by like ear slash what I've learned and like taught myself. So mm -hmm. I have to have recordings. So I have to use my phone so that I can record it and remember the melodies. Um, and then after I finish the songs, I go through and write them in here. Um, and so that they're written down. So if my phone ever crashes, they're safe. Um, but I do write mainly on my phone. I, it's always with me. So if I'm sitting on an airplane, got it, <laughs> wherever it is, mm -hmm. I can start it and figure it out. That's no, so interesting. Make, yeah, mm -hmm. whenever both of you record now, Maria, have you ever used your phone? Like you didn't have one oh. of your phones and notebooks with you, like, oh, phone. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I get most of my inspiration whenever I'm driving down the road. And I'm like you, Jacqueline. I don't, I can't really read music either. I'm trying to teach myself, but it's hard. So yeah. I'm, <laughs> whenever I'm just driving down the road and I'll think of a melody or a line, then I'll just pull out my voice memos and I'll just be singing in the car just so, even if, I have so many like loss that never turn into anything, but at the mm -hmm. moment they felt like something. And so mm -hmm. if I ever need to go back, then I have it there in my voice. Memos. That's yeah, usually what exactly. I do. Exactly. <laughs> For sure. No, I've heard that um, trying to learn how to read music is, is honestly like learning a new language. Oh yeah. Did you put that in strong comparison? I for sure would. I, um, when I was younger, my sister always took piano lessons and so she could read music really well. Um, but when I played, I would read it once and then memorize it. So like every time I would play it after that, I would just remember. And so I found out I wasn't actually reading the music. I would just read it enough to memorize it. And so mm -hmm. like, that's just not how my brain works. So like, it almost like slows me down if I were to read the music rather than just like making it up and remembering it. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know how people do it. It's crazy to me. <laughs> Now, Jacqueline, is that something that, because Maria had told, you know, she nodded earlier, because if you're only listening to the audio podcast, you may not have seen where Maria was also agreeing with you on striving to be able to read more music uh, better. It, is that something that do both of you recognize that, hey, this is just not my learning style, so I'm just going to keep doing what I've done, or, or are both of you in a current state where you're trying to continuously teach yourself how to learn music that way? I mean, is that your goal? Do both of you want to be able to read music or would you rather just continue the style you've done? Well, part of me really wants to be able to read it because um, I'm like you, I like to learn things by ear and I feel like I, it does slow me down a lot whenever I'm trying to look at this sheet and make my hands do that instead of just listening to it and then figuring it out. There goes the cuckoo clock. <laughs> yeah, there's the cuckoo clock. 
making its first appearance on the podcast tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really, I want to, so I can write it down on sheet music because a lot of the stuff that I write isn't just, um, it's not just like words, like songs you would hear on the radio, but I also just like to play the piano sometimes. And sometimes I remember the stuff that I play and then sometimes it, it leaves me. And so I really like to, I'd really like to be better at writing it on sheet music so I could um, have it documented for safekeeping. Yeah. yeah. Now, that makes both sense. You, yeah. Go ahead, Jacqueline. Oh, no, I was just, I'm somewhere in between. Um, just because I, at one point, was taught how to read music. For me, I just think learning style and how I write works a lot better without it. The only reason I would like to learn a little bit more is just because when I've worked with other people, whether it's an accompanist or a full band or whatever it is, it tends to be a lot easier to explain what's in my mind if I'm able to use more correct terms. And so that's where I've learned a little bit of it, um, enough to get my point across and not sound completely like ignorant with music, um, just because I learned so different. Um, I same thing with kind of music theory kind of things. I wish I knew a little bit more just because I feel like that would help me write a little bit faster. Um, instead of having to like go through all my chords and be like, well, which one fits? If you know a little bit more of the theory behind it, you kind of know. Um, so I'd love to know a little bit more, but at the same time, I don't want to learn it. And then I end up changing how I write, if that makes sense. Yeah, that, that makes sense completely. And just to, to wrap up the writing aspect and reading music aspect, and again, neither one of you are claiming to be experts. I know that, but let's just Definitely see if we not. have another, <laughs> yeah, if we have another a, a person listening that is also very, very novice, way more novice than where both of you are at, and, and they, but they run into the same problem. They have mm -hmm. a very difficult time reading music, but they're able to pick it up like the way both of you do. What, what advice would you have for them? Would you have, you know, for right now, like you said, Jacqueline, be cognitive about your own learning, I guess, style, and just mm -hmm. kind of do the best you can with what you have as you're trying to learn how to read that? Is that, I guess what I'm just trying to wrap up as a nice question, what advice would you have for someone younger than you both that may be going through the same thing? Mm -hmm. Um. For me, I guess it would be like try not to get discouraged with your lack of musical knowledge because just because you can't read music does not mean you aren't a musician. Um, and that was a really hard thing for me to learn for a while because I always felt like, wow, like I do music, but like I'm not a musician because I'm not knowledgeable enough to read it. Um, and I just think there's different styles and like just the way my brain works is catered towards um, basic chord and then remembering the rest of it because I'm going to find it on memory anyway. So like just figuring out, sticking to it, figuring out what works for you and trying not to compare yourself and how you do it to other people. Um, because that's not, their success doesn't limit yours, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you on that. I think that whenever I started writing with piano for so long, I just would come up with words and songs with just, um, my voice, like my voice. And I would just remember the melodies. Um, I don't know how but I would just remember the, mm -hmm. the melodies and then later on um like years later middle school I was like I need to I need to learn I would I, I played the guitar a little bit but I really wanted to learn the piano and the only chord that I knew was C <laughs> which doesn't really get you <laughs> very far but then it did get me far because then once you play one note and you hear something that's right then all you have to do is just move move them around a little bit and you're just like just if you're trying to learn how to like play an instrument or how to find a sound that the sound that you want, just keep listening and you'll be able to hear it. If that's like, if that's your style, you'll be able to hear it. I think that's wonderful advice from both of you. And I think this is a good chance to go ahead and shift to our next topic. We're still building on the foundation, especially on your interest level. So Jacqueline, I'll start with you, but again, same question for Maria too. Who or, or and I just said and to who and or what has inspired you throughout your life so far to write these songs? Yeah, um, I find inspiration in literally everything. Um, like sometimes it literally is something that happened to me. It's a memory. Um, it's a family member. It's a relationship. It's what one of my friends went through. And then sometimes it's literally just, oh, this is a line that I like. How about we make this into a story? Um, so I find it from 
every day maybe it's a song that I listen to and like oh that's a cool concept but maybe I would switch it and kind of make it into my own and kind of moving it over a little bit yeah that's me too <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm just gonna agree with everything you said right yeah. there. <laughs> just like even those first few songs that I wrote as a really little kid I think I was just inspired by the people in my life at the time Um, Mm -hmm. and then as I look back at my other songs that I've written throughout the years, it's always about, it's, it's usually about people that I'm with, whether it's friends or family or boyfriends or, you know, whatever is going on in my life. Or like you said, my friends, or Mm -hmm. even just like, if I'm driving down the road and I see this person like on the side of the street, like maybe I start brainstorming about, I mean, I wonder what their story's like, Mm -hmm. maybe they're doing this and then just picking up stories by just literally everyone that you interact with. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I I accidentally muted Jacqueline there. I got to... Jacqueline, you have to unmute yourself. I thought it was (laughs) Yeah, so... All good. (laughs) Just just, just kind of picking apart what both of you said. Both of you have definitely valid reasons for what inspires you to write music. But I'm curious about, is there certain times? So, for example, like, during certain times of the year, are you more than likely to write a song because of a certain influence? So for example, in the winter time, people tend to get a little bit more cabin fever and then the the weather changes a different way. So it could cause some people to feel more depression, but at the same time, it also causes some people to feel more jovial. Some people love Halloween. They love that winter aspect. It gets close to the holidays. And and I know both of you are very family oriented. Um, the, whatever weather is going on, whatever season it is, does that often affect what it is that you're writing? Definitely. <laughs> For me, it definitely does. Um, all of my, well, a lot of the happiest songs that I've written are definitely during the summer, just because that that's my, like, I'm thriving during the summer. I feel like the sun really helps me, you know, <laughs> move forward. I love I love going like to amusement parks and just the aspect of being around people, which has kind of got taken away from me this season. (laughs) But I think I write a a lot more joyful songs during summer and whether like, I don't know. And then whenever I get into winter, maybe it's like some of those, which I've had like bad things in my past that like winter kind of reminds me of. And so I'll, I'll write less whenever I'm like, if I'm, in my feels, then I'm actually mm-hmm. usually writing less than whenever I'm in touch of, with like, with my joy, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Cause I can write about sad stuff, but if I'm, if I'm not in the right mindset, even then I can't put my pen to my paper and instead I'll just write nothing, which is the worst because mm-hmm. writing is therapy to me. And so like being like vulnerable with myself and just making myself write, especially during the winter is super important, but the happiest stuff is definitely in the summer for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, for me, I pretty much write sad, happy all year round. Like for me, I love the winter as much as I love the summer for different reasons. I love fall. That's one of my favorite times, but um, there are times where I'm like more motivated to write, but I don't think it has as much to do with like the time of year as much as like the stage of life that I'm in and who I'm surrounded with. Um, mm-hmm. And so there have been some times in my life where I'm like more confused and stressed and like more lonely, I guess. And that doesn't necessarily mean it was in the winter. It was like springtime and super happy, but like, Mm -hmm. it was just how I felt. Um, so it's not as much the outside world, like months or years or seasons as much as like my season of life that I'm in. No, I have a question now, just kind of about, it's a metaphysical question about, I guess what songwriting provides for you. So I'm a huge fan of the band Blue October. Anybody that's a close friend of mine knows I'm a huge fan of Justin Furstenfeld, the lead singer, who also Mm -hmm. writes his own music and whatnot. And I followed his career and through depression, through substance abuse, and through gaining his faith back now and really improving his life, having children, repairing his relationships and whatnot. He has always said, something very curious to me when I watched the documentary that was on, I think called get back up. He had said that writing music is very therapeutic or can be very therapeutic. Would both of you mind uh, letting our listeners know has writing music from time to time or all the time, even has it been therapeutic for you? 100%. (laughs) Yeah. 
Um, like for me, I'm not always the person that's going to go to somebody and just spill my guts and spill my feelings and my emotions. Like I love, I'm more of the listener for like other people to do that. Um, but as far as personally, I tend to like hold it in. I like to be happy. I don't like to, I hate sadness. I hate to cry. And so like for that, I like to, I just, I hold it in and that's how I am. So for songwriting, it's kind of been that healthy way for me to get it out and get it on paper without having to necessarily like involve someone else or be super vulnerable, vulnerable with someone else in specific ways. Um, and so may, maybe nobody will ever hear that song, but for me, it captures that emotion and it gets it out. And so that's always been super helpful. Um, yes, it's, it's always been very therapeutic to me. I've, instead of like writing a journal, like entries or whatever, lots of times at night, because I've always kept a journal, writing in general, even if it's not songs, is just very important in my life to, it just keeps me in touch with my mind. And so if, but whenever I really, really started to love songwriting, I would just write at night. And a lot of times I like, you don't really know, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, Jacqueline, but whenever you're just kind of stuck and you don't really know what you're mm -hmm. feeling, but you just make yourself sit down and just start writing. I don't know if you've ever done that, but yeah. those, some of those songs are the most um, true in touch with how I'm actually feeling, even though maybe I don't know that I'm in touch with myself. Like yeah. I feel out of touch, but as soon as I start writing, I understand how I'm feeling, even if I didn't understand it before. Mm -hmm. I understand what, I, what I'm going through and why I maybe feel this way. It's, and I found a lot of clarity whenever, during those times, I make myself sit down and write. Yeah, for sure. You know, I'm curious, and I respect what both of you had to say about that, because I, I do feel like, I know that from, the, from a person I love listening to music, music, as I asked you in one of my plan questions, music does play a big role in my life as far as what I listen to, if I'm driving to work, if I'm just hanging out at home, those kind of things. But I, I figure it's got to be on a whole nother different kind of level whenever you also not only listen to music all the time, but you write your own music, you try to learn how mm -hmm. to play it. I, I respect all those different factors. I kind of have a, uh, another question about the writing aspect, especially from someone that's new doing it. You know, when I, when I think of potentially writing a, a book someday, I'm very interested in two things. Someday I told my girlfriend that I would love to write a children's book. I, I want to write a children's book someday. And I would like to write a book someday about education, about being a teacher and like my own crazy style that I have. But I know somewhere along the line, you know, that takes a, that takes a very strong, consistent commitment, but sooner or later I'm going to have writer's block. So from two individuals that you do write your own songs, what do you do whenever you do hit a point where you get stuck? And Maria kind of touched base on that a little bit earlier. You mentioned getting stuck sometimes and stopping. What's your best advice for people that are trying to do what you, you both have done and continue to do, but they often get stuck or they find themselves every once in a while getting stuck? What would you advise them? Well, I actually wrote something down before. <laughs> <laughs> Go for uh, it. I had to feel you like this planned out even further, Maria. Yeah. <laughs> what a um, what a planner, right, Jack? <laughs> or I oh, no. <laughs> I'm just winging it. So <laughs> I something that I wrote down was, and I'm gonna I'll elaborate, but um, don't worry about it being good, um, and just writing something that means something to you. Um, when but whenever I'm not writing regularly, uh. I feel like a lot of times it's because I'm not looking to be inspired. I'm just kind of going like throughout my life, just kind of chilling, just kind of, uh, just kind of one track minded. I'm not really looking to write, but whenever I want to write, I can. And so sometimes I don't know if it's, I, I get super inspired whenever I meet new people. I'm like learning about a lot about someone new, maybe like, just someone that I just randomly met and I'm like new friends with, I get inspired by those things. I'm definitely, I definitely get writer's block quite a bit, especially whenever I really, I really want to write something and I don't know how to put it down. And so whenever I'm at that point, that's whenever I just, I don't worry about it being good anymore. I just, I just start writing and I listen for things that might inspire me to help myself. Mm -hmm. See, for me, if I ever get writer's block or anything like that, which definitely happens quite a bit, I usually 
I deal with it probably a little bit differently is I will walk away and that's not always like the best thing, but for me, it helps to walk away, um, from the situation that I'm writing about or whatever it is and take a couple days and then come back with new eyes. And I feel like you can see where things either need to be fixed or whether they could be expanded on or just things to add. And so I usually come back later and just finish it. Um, cause I feel like when I force myself to write, I am not as true to what I actually want to say. I'm like, well, I just want to get this done. These syllables fit. This kind of makes sense. Like just go with it. So I feel like it ends up with a better product when I just walk away, let myself have a break from it, kind of think on it a little bit and then come back to it, listen to it. Um, for me, listening to it is like the best part. I'll take a voice memo of like whatever I've gotten so far, whether it's just a first verse and then just the open ending at the end, as soon as it stops, I'll leave a few seconds on the memo. And then, um, a lot of times my brain will just like make up what's next. And so as soon as I hear it, then I can kind of continue. I'm like exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like whenever I'm like whenever I'm walking away, it's just cause I, I'm like done with it. <laughs> and yeah. so maybe I, like, I'll just, maybe I will start something, but if I start something that I don't finish, I'm probably not going to finish it for like a year. Like it'll just be, I'll go back and then like, Oh yeah, I forgot about that. I probably need to finish that. Mm -hmm. But whenever I like finally get my pen down or I finally start like singing, whatever it is, then it, usually I'll just write the whole thing all at once mm -hmm. and then I'm just kind of done with it and then maybe like kind of like what you said though it, a couple of days later I'll go back and I'll be like oh wait yeah. that's really bad let me fix that real quick yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like how many songs do you think you've written I don't know if you have them counted or anything but just I don't an I'm not as meticulous as you um a lot here you give me a number you can be a number I finished? Yeah, this estimation yeah, I just, it's curious because if she sits down and finishes every song or most songs that she does, then like, obviously you're going to have a lot more than me, <laughs> but, and that's totally fine. Like it's not a competition at all, but like, I think I just hit 40, 42, something like that, um, mm -hmm. over quarantine. And then all that I have, I have them organized in my notes of like ideas, beginnings in the works. And then I have the catalog of like, what's actually done. Um, and so then if you counted all the rest of them, then I'm probably well over 200, but like when you are actually finished <laughs> solid 40. Um, I just tend to be a really like perfectionist. And so I have this idea of how I want it to sound. And so I keep working on it. <laughs> so some of them I've literally started probably back in like 2017 and they're like, just need a chorus. And I just haven't gotten through it yet. It just hasn't been fully inspired yet. Yeah. But it's just hanging out in the beginnings category and it'll be there for a while. So yeah. That's, that's really interesting because I like, I have this, like, um, like this container in my mm -hmm. room of just random like notes pages that I've like ripped out from like random, like binders and stuff whenever I like was inspired. And so <laughs> I'm, I'm not as organized as you. So I have <laughs> lots of like beginnings and like lots of random mm -hmm. choruses and then like just kind of journals filled up with stuff. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. I really need to like, I really need to. Yeah go through and but I think I probably like 50 probably not as much as many more than you think <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because just completely finished mm -hmm. like you said because I, I do I'll do like write something and then rip it mm -hmm. out but then I'm also bad yeah. at going back mm -hmm. and finishing yeah I, no I totally get I feel that. like this I feel like this episode is going to inspire Maria over the next few days now she's gonna go dig up all these yeah <laughs> yeah well, like, for me, things that she has yeah for me it just really helps like I'm not necessarily the most organized person in life you can ask my parents, but like, I know where everything is. Um, <laughs> and so for me, it helps like, cause when I sit down to write either, I have an idea already, but if I don't, I'm just like, I feel like writing tonight. I haven't in a while. It helps me to be able to go, well, do I want to sit here and fully craft a song starting from scratch? Do I want to start with some other idea or am I wanting to just put finishing touches on something? And so it helps me to be able to just like go through the categories and like see what I have and be like, Oh, this one's kind of sad and slow. I kind of feel that tonight, or I'm not in the mood for sad. I can do something happier. And so I can kind of like scroll through everything. Um, and then that way it's just easier for me to figure out what kind of mood and what am I going to write? And is it going to get finished? Maybe. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, both of you remind me of my next kind of question. It's going to be more formed around the word clarity. Uh, when I was trying very unsuccessfully to be a stand-up comedian when I was your age, 
I, I remember having like this little notebook with me and it was really when cell phones first started to become a little bit more popular. I mean, it was, it was still like 10 cents for every text that you did if you didn't have a plan. That's how crazy it <laughs> mm -hmm. was. Uh, you guys could be like millions of dollars by now. Oh my like, gosh. But I remember, I remember having advice from other like uh, startup comedians that, you know, you always want to keep something to write on close to you. I've heard comedians say they woke up in the middle of the night before in a hotel room and they have like a notepad by their bed that they get up and they write something down real quick because it's kind of like a dream. If you don't write it down immediately, it's just going to fly away like a yep. flock of doves in there. But my, my question about it is I, I did do that. I would listen to it. I would write some notes down. But I was never good at being very, very precise in what I was writing down. So sometimes I would go back later, and I do it now as a history teacher too. You both know I'm obsessed with annotating. But I'll go through and I'll write stuff in books and whatnot. And if I don't write enough, sometimes I'll go back later a month or a year later and go, what the hell? was I talking about? I did you know, look at a joke that I wrote. I'm like, I don't even know what was, because at the time I, I knew I was laughing my ass off, but I know looking at it now, I'm like, I have no idea why that's funny. So just out of curiosity, have either one of you taken notes over something that, you know, a song or some lyrics down only later on to go back to and go, what the, what was I doing? Like, did, you know, did either one of you ever have moments you want to share that happened similar to that? Um, I have, kind of a similar thing with the journal beside my bed you know and most of the things just come to me like while I'm trying to sleep and I'm like uh, it's, what is it 2 a.m oh uh lyric gotta turn that lamp on write this down scribble 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 and it's funny because I actually have um something right here in front of me that uh that's literally exactly what you're doing and I was trying to find it but I <laughs> I don't know what it, I don't know what it means either. <laughs> so, so yes, that happens quite a bit actually is where I was like, I have an idea and I think that, I think it's a good idea, but it's mostly because I'm so tired and mm -hmm. then I'll look back yeah. and I'm like, oh, I'm not sure where I was going with that. Maybe yeah. I need to look back at that at 2 a.m. and maybe I'll remember. Maybe it'll make sense. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm the same way for sure. I, same way, except for usually I just voice memo it. Um, <laughs> cause a lot of times it'll be like, words with a melody at least when I'm laying in bed and so like I'll just record it real quick and then it'll be all in there um but the thing is I don't usually go back through my voice memos so they're just like all these random like 10 second clips and I never like label them so it's just whatever address I'm at so yes I'm at Belmont University and then it's like Nashville Tennessee Russellville Kentucky <laughs> um and so I need to go through, um, those are a mess and I need to, because they're taking up so much storage on my phone. Um, but for I sure. can see that being yeah. really confusing to go back and yeah. try to figure out which ones you said where or that, which surprises me about you too. Cause I remember you two being yeah. so organized. Yeah. And again, obviously your work ethic is there. It's just your labeling skills need to yeah. be more I mean, like the ones that are a little more relevant, like if they're over 30 seconds, they're labeled. It's just the mm -hmm. ones that are like, this doesn't have a title. It's like a random. <laughs> random little hum or like one liner that like <laughs> other context yeah. um those need to be labeled <laughs> well you know I, I hate to turn a little bit more serious but I, I i mean this is not a get you podcast i'm not here to like prove you too wrong right in front of a bunch <laughs> of other but it's not my goal or nothing but sometimes as, as i taught both of you in school sometimes confrontation is is necessary well in this case you're actually confronting something about yourself so I want to address another thing that both of you mentioned that is one of the many variables that tie in to inspiring you. And you both mentioned relationships. So you know this was coming. I was going to ask you something yeah. about that. So I have to ask you something because, you know, going through college, I was, a, I was a relatively big John Mayer fan. I always respected him as a musician, his skills. I know Taylor Swift, I think, writes her own music. Mm -hmm. Maria, I don't know if she remembers this, but I remember when I think it was her junior or senior year, I showed her this song from Sarah Bareilles that was called She Used to Be Mine. Mm -hmm. And that's an incredible song because there's massive self-reflection there off of that mm -hmm. stuff. Okay, so both of you admitted that not necessarily had played them in front of people, but you definitely have written songs about relationships. And I assume that they've been good about relationships and they've also been the bad side or the sad side of relationships. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that this, this is going to sound like kind of a devil's advocate question. I don't mean it to be negative to each one of you, but more of just how do you do it, but in, in an ethical way that also like, I guess if it's a, especially if it's a good song or, or even if it's a critical one, does it preserve the, I guess, I can't even think of the word right now, 
I'm not saying the prestige of that person, but I guess the respect of that person or, mm -hmm. or with each other. Um, so, you know, you hear people will write diss tracks about each other sometimes or write songs about the relationship and they just talk about that person like they're an animal and it's very exaggerated and more than mm -hmm. likely than what it was really like. Well, if, if that gets on a record someday or, or something like that and it goes on the radio, man, that person is like highly affected by that song and the mm -hmm. lyrics that you wrote. Mm -hmm. So I have to ask, and the key word that I want to focus on in philosophy tonight is the word sensationalism. I know in history class, I taught you both what sensationalized means, but in this case, it's more of, I guess, to over-exaggerate. Now, obviously, you both are, are artists in a way, like you're, you're trying to write music. There's going to be a little bit of a sensationalism, sensationalism in your lyrics because it's a song and you want it to be something that means a lot to you and it, people are going to like it. So I, I want to know, where do you know where to draw the line at? Because that's what I'm curious on is you want to, you want to add a little bit of uh, drama, a little bit of sensationalism to the song, but how do you know wh where to draw the line at between going overboard and being not realistic enough, not genuine enough? So I guess my question is, how do each one of you find a balance in be to prevent yourself from being too sensationalist when you write songs about relationships? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and I think that that's just part of songwriting in a way is like not every relationship that I've been in is like going to be that interesting to write a song about. So like, um, in a way you have to exaggerate it slightly, um, just so that people somewhere will be able to relate to it because people aren't going to like listen to a song. And you're like, we went out to eat once and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're like, um, world and yeah, exactly. But also, in a way, when you're dealing with love or when you're dealing with what your feeling is in the moment, it is dramatic, um, especially for me. I mean, it's going to be one way or the other, go hard or go home. So like in a way you're capturing that moment. And so it's going to be a little dramatic. Um, so it's got to be a little bit more entertaining and I don't write to entertain people. I write so that people can, for me to remember a certain memory attached or um, so that other people can see pieces of their stories within my story. Um, and so it's just got to be, it's hard though, because there's a balance between being broad enough where people can relate and specific enough where it seems personal. And so um, for me, I guess the line is drawn somewhere in the middle, depending on where the situation is and how close I was to it and how hurt or how happy and joyful I was, because it really just depends. But overall, my goal is never to be so specific that everyone knows who the person was and are they're like gonna go egg their house or anything like that's like crazy to me um and I never <laughs> want to be mean or call anyone out because um just because a person makes a mistake does not make them a bad person um and I always try to remind myself of them of that um and how I would feel if I was on the other end of a song um and so I always try to keep that in mind when I'm writing yes I agree with you on that one too I think that for me um, I have to really, like, if it's something or someone that was really important to me, I have to step back for a while and really think about uh, the relationship. A, a song that I wrote comes to mind, and it's one of those that it's like, I don't know if I would actually ever let anyone hear that song, mm -hmm. but it's something that brought me a lot of clarity, and so it's it's kind of, it's, a, it's an odd line because I even draw it whenever I'm writing songs for myself. But at the same time, like when I, if I were to share something that I wanted someone to hear, it's either going to be um, based on a person, but inserting them into like a different storyline um, where it doesn't seem like realistic that that would actually be about somebody that was in my life. Or I just completely just keep it to myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, it sounds to me like, and this is one of those situations we've had discussions like this before in the past where like most things in life, there's not a black side and a white side. Mm -hmm. Like it's just not as easy to say that line that I'm asking both of you to draw at. It's not as easy to say it's right here. It's exactly mm -hmm. here. Yeah. And what I gather from what both of you say, rather than it being a black line, it's actually pretty thick and it's more of multiple shades of gray to mm -hmm. dark. It's very, it's very difficult to find that balance because I, I feel like you, both of you, and along with other people that write music, you have to kind of write, you're walking a tightrope a little bit. Mm -hmm. You're kind of trying to find a balance. 
And Jacqueline, you and Maria both brought up something that's a really good point, and that is you want your songs to still be, you want them to be general, but you want them to be relatable too, though. Like people, mm -hmm. most people feel love or desire love, or and, and most people have suffered, if not all people have suffered or know what loss is. So you want it to be general, but you also don't want it to be too cookie cutter. Like you mm -hmm. don't want it to, you still have to do something that's going to stand out to you. Now, on a funnier side of the question, <laughs> Have either one of you ever been in a situation where you were seeing it, performing it, and your significant other was there? Other than a cuckoo clock in the background that's gone right now. Perfect timing. But Love I just have to know it. Has there ever been a they moment where your significant other was there? And maybe they didn't know they were in the song, but you knew that they were there. Um, unfortunately, yes. Um, and I've been in other situations where um, recently one of the songs that I wrote, I played out somewhere and I posted a video of it and then I was hanging out with one of my larger friend groups, um, like a week or two later. And one of the people quoted the song back to the person that they thought it was about in front of me in a way to be like sneaky. Um, and they thought I didn't notice and I didn't say anything about it. But the funny thing is that's not even who the person, the song was about. So they were wrong. But like for me, that's been the hardest part of songwriting is trying not to get people thinking I'm talking about them because half the time, again, it's some random story. Like it may have pieces of a person in them, um, but it's not always just this is my relationship with this person. Um, and so, I mean, there's a lot of vulnerabil vulnerability in that, I guess. But as far as saying like, I've never like written a love song and sang it to someone and been like, this is about you, um, or anything like that. Um, but I don't know. It's, it's a, it's a hard thing, I guess. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever actually, I don't know if I've ever actually sang a song about someone like to them or like with a group or anything like that. But I've definitely, I've definitely sang, I guess I have, but it wasn't, it wasn't awkward for me because Wait, it was, here, it was so to, vague. To clarify, I just want to clarify something too, because the way I asked it was kind of weird. And, and I didn't want to put it in a situation where I meant you two were somewhere and you knew the person was there and you're singing to them. I just <laughs> mean, you happen to be singing a song that meant a lot to you and it involves someone and that person just happened to be at that bar or that concert mm -hmm. or that mm -hmm. assembly or whatever there might be just just that awkward moment where you know that that person is in the room somewhere and you're actually doing a song that involves that person yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. unfortunately it happens <laughs> i mean like i think it's kind of funny because like in that moment they have no idea <laughs> yeah they don't <laughs> have any like, idea like this is amazing um but yeah. it's never it was, the song that i'm talking about is like it was not a bad song like in for me, that song wasn't even really written about one specific person. So it wasn't awkward, but it, at the same time, it's like you're wondering if they've picked up on the little pieces that are their story. Um, well, and I'm never guys, probably them. not, because we're not very good at reading between the lines. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, hopefully, hopefully not. <laughs> they're like, uh. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I like the way it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's what I like to hear. <laughs> Well, you know, Jacqueline, you, you had something really interesting you said earlier, too, that I'm sure both of you could agree on, is that when you write songs about your relationship, you know, if anybody happens to be critical uh, about what it is that you wrote or what it is that you sung, people need to understand the why. And that's a, as a history teacher, I'm obsessed with the why. I even have a shirt that just says why on it that I wear at school all the time because I, I constantly ask that all the time because – Anybody can look at lyrics and infer what they think your song mm -hmm. means. And this is one of the biggest things that I have. I would love to do episodes where we look at lyrics of a song. And then maybe I have you and Maria on and we talk about what do we think this song was written for. And those are always hard because we can't get in the mind of the artist and know exactly why they wrote it. We see people misinterpret songs all the time. Now, as far as, I guess, uh, critiquing goes, have either one of you been criticized before by what you wrote? or and or what you sung um yeah um not to the point where it was like mean or anything but it was kind of just I've had a couple times where somebody's been like oh you're right and they'll like ask me to send them a song and I mean again like it's a very scary thing especially when you write a new one to like share it with someone because 
to you, it may be super significant. And so you almost feel like, um, this is important to me because of the memories that are attached. And so like, there've been a couple times where they're like, Oh, it was cute. Like, you know, and like in that situation, cute is not what you're going for. Uh, or like, Oh, it was a good song for like a high school or, or, you know, and so, I mean, it's hard, but at the same time, you have to take that and kind of try to grow from that and kind of realize that you do have room to grow and it's constructive at the same time, but just their opinion doesn't really um, define, um, what the song is and because it, it just because it means something to you means it, it's going to mean something to someone at some point somewhere yeah I think that I am I really like criticize <laughs> myself and I, maybe it's because like we talked about a little bit earlier I'm not at a like music orientated orient orientated orient Anybody? Oriented. Anybody want to help me out there? Oriented. <laughs> oriented. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. A music-oriented school that I'm not. Maybe I'm maybe just not seeking out like help, and so I will like I will be so cautious on sending a song because I'm just afraid that it's not going to be good enough or whatever. And so I've I've definitely like I've I've shared with friends before that have. Like been like, oh, you're gonna put that in there, and I'm like, uh, yeah, let me change that around a little bit. Like, good call, mm-hmm. good call. But um, I think it's just because me, I'm still at that stage where I'm trying to decide if I really want to put my stuff out there or if I want to write for other people. That mm-hmm. I haven't really, I haven't even opened myself up to criticism just because I'm mm-hmm. just still nervous about it. Yeah, no, it's I hard. See why? No, both of you reminded me. I mean, both of you did answers that I think go perfectly into my next question that I had written down. And that is, uh, my question is when to share. So anybody that's listening, that's writing their own music. And Maria, I respect that you're admitting it too, because there, there is a little bit of a fear factor there, I'm sure. And, and I'm sure authors go through this when they go through writing stuff, especially if it's their first time ever writing a book and they, they do eight, nine, 10 different drafts of what they do. And I'm sure you do multiple drafts of what you write for songs. So I guess the, the question is, when is the best time to share? When, when do you know this is it? This is the time that I, I'm ready to share this song. Sometimes I have zero reservations towards a song. And that's whenever I'm like, you know what? This could be helpful to someone. This could be uplifting to someone. Um, and I kind of take it out of my hands. And I, whenever I'm thinking about other people, instead of thinking about myself, myself that's whenever I feel like, I'm ready to put something out there. Whereas like if it's something that's um, really personal to me or um, I don't feel like a lot of people could relate to, then I just, I kind of keep it to myself until, like you said, maybe I'll go back and draft it and make it more relatable or more helpful to people. But whenever I write a song that, um, um, I'll give you an example. I was by myself at the house like a couple weeks ago and I just started humming. I just started singing the song. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to write this song real quick. And so I went to the piano and I got to play as loud as I wanted because no one was home. And I just, I just sat there and I just wrote the song out really, really fast. And um, then I, I was like, you know what? I feel like someone could use this. Um, so I recorded it really fast with my voice memo and then I posted it on Facebook without thinking about it. Because whenever I overthink things, I also feel like it slows me down. And so I think there are other songs that maybe when has already passed and that I've just not taken that opportunity. But I feel like whenever I know, I know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense though. <laughs> yeah. For me, um, I don't think I would ever be ready if I like let myself think it over. Um, like every time I sing a new song at a show or for send a voice memo to somebody or anything like that, it's always, I'm always freaked out. I'm like, oh, they're, they, what if they think it's terrible? And like, what if nobody likes this song? It's scary every time until I've played it a couple times and then it becomes normal again. Um, mm-hmm. And so I don't know, for me, I never get over that like scaredness of playing it for the first time in front of someone. Again, I know that's a kind of a difficult question to ask because it's rather abstract. I mean, I'm sure there are songs. It's probably very subjective, which I'm sure is a word Maria heard too much, heard junior year, but it's subjective depending probably sometimes on the song because I, 
what I gather from both of your answers is that it also kind of depends on the song. And, and if you've mm-hmm. had an apprentice and whatnot, and maybe what it's even about has to do with that. Now, another kind of difficult question in some way, it doesn't have to necessarily be specific, but just more of gaining more of perspective on what you go through, both of you mentally, when you're writing these songs. Have, you ever, have either one of you ever written a song that brought you to tears? For sure. Yeah. You go for first. Sure. You go first. Yeah. No, sometimes I'm in tears and I start writing the song. And like, for me, that's when, that's the song that I finish in 20 minutes. Like, that's because I have something to say. Like, I have something that's on my heart that's like, I'm hurting. And like, so the words just come out because um, if I were to wait a week, then like, it's not, that emotion isn't so attached. And so like, may, it's like that emotion is put straight onto the page for me. Um, and so that same way I've ended up crying in the middle of a song. Like, if, especially if I'm writing like about a grandparent, a mom, dad, sister, a friend, anyone like that, telling someone else's story that breaks my heart, anything like that. Um, and that's how I know that I'm on the right track in a way, because if it's not bringing me to tears and it means that much to me, then I haven't done it justice. Maria's on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, the voicemail was going off over there. <laughs> um, uh, Everybody on the sound cloud is just going to think you had a dramatic pause to really dramatic think Dramatic pause. <laughs> Let me just think about this. Okay, here we go. I'm ready. <laughs> um, for me, whenever I am the same way, it's just kind of got to get this all down at once. I'll think of, I think of a line a lot of times or just a concept. Um, I wrote a song last summer and I was sitting and I was at a church camp and I was quiet time and so I was sitting with my journal that they had given me just one more to add to the collection and so I was sitting there and I was like I had this idea all of a sudden I was reading a psalm and it was talking about how God molds you and um, through your pain and that kind of stuff and so all of a sudden like this thought came to my mind and I was like good grief Uh, because you hear people say that all the time. Oh, good grief. Like, are you okay? But I was like thinking about that. And I was like, and for so long, I've been sitting in a lot of grief and just bad, 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 bad. And I was like, this is, you know, like I wasn't thinking at all about how I was growing from it. And so I sat down there and I wrote, I wrote idea, colon, good grief. And then I just sat there and I teared up a little bit, you know, while I was writing it and just, just trying to get everything out. And then another time, like if I'm talking about examples, um, I, a lot of, like I was saying, sometimes I just, I won't write for a while and then I'll just sit down and make myself. And during those times, I usually, it's just, I just start playing the piano or doing something like that. And it will usually bring me to tears, like just like singing how I'm feeling. <laughs> mm-hmm. It could make no sense, but then I'll like, but whenever I say something that does make sense, then I'll, that usually kind of brings me clarity and like, it'll bring me to tears and I'll just like start writing through that concept. Um, the one that comes to mind is something, it's a song called that I wrote called the happy you. And it's about, um, how being around someone and learning all of this, um, like the, the deep stuff, the sad stuff, maybe like about your past, but then never getting to that fun layer of just like, what's your favorite color, that kind of stuff. And so, um, but whenever I wrote that, I just started playing and I, it had been something that I've been thinking about for a long time, but just wouldn't make myself, I wouldn't write about it. And so whenever I just sat down and um, saying, I want the happy you too, it brought me a lot of clarity. And I, that's just one example that I think of that I definitely <laughs> was brought to tears by writing that song. Well, I appreciate both of you sharing that. And, you know, it's something that I wanted to share with both of you that I'm, I'm rather ashamed of to admit. Uh, I guess I'm going to lose some guy points for saying this, but it's okay if that happens. Uh, you know, before, you know, my, my ex-wife and I are still really close friends. We got a divorce, but we're still really close. But a few years ago, she actually talked me into going to my first musical. I've never attended a musical before. But I thought, you know, <laughs> I like movies and whatnot. This would be kind of cool because it's kind of like seeing a movie. I mean, I, I haven't even been to much plays. But I've always respected plays because it's like you're seeing a real life movie right in front of you. Mm-hmm. But I went to watch Rent, which as both of you know is a very like it's early '90s. It's very risky, 
my topic with AIDS and homosexuality and whatnot. And also I witnessed something and we were sitting in the front row dead center. So it felt like they were singing to me and her. Mm -hmm. And it felt like they were just seeing us. So there's a moment and you know both how I am. I never shut up, but I didn't, I was speechless. And it's whenever the whole cast lines up and they're singing this song where it's like, uh, oh my God, why can I not remember the title of the song right now? Where basically it's like, will I lose my dignity? And, and will this nightmare ever end? That kind of thing. And they all sing it one at a time, but then they start singing it in like rounds over each other. But every one of them, but especially like the main ones in the middle that one of the characters had previously died in the musical, they were crying for real. Like every one of them. And these people perform this two, three days a week for months and, and these people are, are performing in front of us, and it's like they're in the moment so much it, that emotion has hit them. Now, I know staying composed as someone that performs is really important for both of you. You know, I've shared this story about my father passing away in front of me, and that was always a little bit hard for me to share to my classes, but I was always able to stay more composed as the years went through. Have either one of you ever been close or had been brought to tears as you were actually performing it? And then what was that like? Uh, yes, I have. Um, it was more of a almost happy tears. Um, but I wrote a song for uh, one of my good friends when she got married. Um, and so it was a surprise um, that me and her mom put together and like sang it for her at her wedding. Um, and so I was doing really good. I wasn't looking at her. And then she hadn't cried the whole, the actual whole wedding. Um, I think she teared up before she walked down the aisle and then that was fine. And then all of a sudden she just starts like bawling. And so I glance over to her and she's bawling and I like motion to my guitar player and I'm like, keep going. Let me, let me get myself back together for a minute. Um, and so he played through the chords a little bit. He was cracking up. Um, and so I ended up getting through the song, but um, definitely had to take a moment. And he played through the the little chord progression about four I, times I just, I just <laughs> in front of everyone. Completely. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because <laughs> I'm a person, if I see someone else crying, I immediately start crying. Um, and so I look over at her and I was like, nope, I turned around, took a minute <laughs> and then uh, kept going after that. But well, I feel like that's what you got to do. You got to avoid eye contact. That's yes, why I the avoid chat. at all costs. Did you lock those eyes and you see yeah. the waterworks going? Mm -hmm. I speak your deck like, oh. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much going. in front of the whole wedding at the reception. <laughs> I was like, y'all. You did have the singers crying, then everybody in the congregation yeah. starts crying. So it's just, oh it's like gosh. that scene on Stand By Me where everybody throws up on each other, except it's yeah. not in that way. Yeah. Um, you know, same question over to you, Maria. Have you ever had a moment like that or a moment that came close to that? I've had a couple of moments whenever I've um, performed that I feel really emotional and I've never, I've never cried. <laughs> Sorry, Jacqueline, <laughs> but <laughs> I've never actually cried, but I've felt it's like a, definitely a surge of emotions where I'm like, I've just got to get through this <laughs> where mm -hmm. I'm either it's like, um, King of my heart. That's what I sang at the um, talent show uh, last year with a few of my friends. And I've sang that song so many times in my car, but whenever I started singing it in front of the school, it almost felt like, um, just like kind of a, like a little bit of a testimony, like, a like I was sharing, this is like, who is the king of my heart? And like proclaiming that in front of the entire school, um, was really powerful. And I was, I was, I was really close to tears then um, just thinking about where I've like, like how far I'd come from that point on. And just that, that was really emotional for me, but I, I didn't cry. I don't know how I didn't, yeah. but you it <laughs> I made it. <laughs> yeah. Stay strong, stay strong. You know, along the lines of this, cause I do, you know, I'm a big sports guy. So I, I used to be a huge baseball fan. I'm not quite as big as I used to be, but no ba baseball players are very superstitious and, a lot of them have routines that they do before they go out and perform or before they go up to bat. I have to know, does Jacqueline or Maria, do either one of you have like a, like a ritual? Not like a, we're going to sacrifice a lamb or something like that. <laughs> you, have like, you have a routine, a ritual, a, a drink, a, a food, something that you do before you go to perform that, that kind of gets you in the, in the mode or locks you in or makes you feel more calm. Um, for me, I don't think I have like a specific – um, like ritual or anything because a lot of times um, when I'm singing somewhere it ends up being somehow very last minute 
Um, and so <laughs> a lot of times I don't have a super long time to prepare. So like whether I'm running over something in the parking lot with my guitarist uh, or anything like that. Um, the one thing that is constant is I always try to say a prayer before I go, just because that little moment of quiet and communication with God is just like calms me because whether I'm nervous or not, I tend to get adrenaline rushes right before I go on. Um, and like, and most of the time adrenaline is great, but when you are like trying to stay still and your hands are shaking from adrenaline instead of nerves, it can be kind of, kind of weird. So um, that's the only thing recently I've tried to start doing, um, like if I'm really, really nervous for something, whether it's an audition or um, a bigger show or anything like that, then I'll sit and like, just for like 10 minutes, just breathing. And I always like made fun of people like the high school musical thing where they're like doing the hand exercises and all that. Um, but like actually focusing on like, like a deep breath in the nose, out the mouth, like really like lowers my heart rate and brings that adrenaline back down. So I'm a little bit more steady. Yes. Same. I will, um, same with you. I'll say a little prayer there right before. <laughs> That's like, yeah. I need that right before. <laughs> Please <And> then, help. <laughs> But for me, I really do like, I, I breathe and I'll hum a lot by myself. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I also really don't like being alone before I perform. So like mm -hmm. if I'm backstage somewhere, I want to be talking to people and I want to be like hyping other people up. Mm -hmm. Like, that. like um, if it's ever like a multiple people type of thing or going to perform and multiple people are backstage then I'm like, I want to hype you up. And whenever I'm helping mm -hmm. other people be less nervous, it somehow makes me less nervous. I'm like, I want you to be confident. And then I'm like, <laughs> I need to be confident. <laughs> it just mm -hmm. helps me go back and forth between like helping other people helps me. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I don't know what I'll ever do if I'm at a show by myself and I'm like sitting there alone. I'm like, all right, I really am going to be just praying the whole time. <laughs> I'll be like, you've got this. And he'll be like, mm -hmm. you got this. And you tell your friends, I need you to tell me that I got this. I yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's true that. it's, it's, it's crazy to hear that side of both of you, but it, it's really cool to hear it. You know, moving to a, another topic. So we've talked a little bit about relationships and how that's impacted you and, and different things. I, I do want to focus a little bit more on your faith. And I know that plays a large role into your life uh, and not just your life, but into your songwriting too. Mm -hmm. and I just want to know is, I, I guess to an extent, I want the listeners to know, you know, what depth or what role does faith or your faith play in your songwriting? And how do, do, does that encourage you to songwrite more and to be more involved because you have faith? And, and just in general, what, what, is, what has faith done for you when it comes to songwriting? For me, um, it's whenever it's kind of hard to write some religious songs uh, or at least like yeah, worship music mm -hmm. um, because that relationship is greater than any other little relationship I can write about, about a little boy, you know, <laughs> who broke my heart or whatever. <laughs> and trying to make like a worship song, especially something that people can connect to and like writing like a metaphor, like trying to get people's minds in the right place. It can be so difficult whenever you're talking about something so big. It's like, it's for me, it's like, how can I compare God's love to anything that we can wrap our minds around? And so that's kind of difficult for me. But with other songwritings, I feel like my faith has um, definitely kept me going on it um, because I've been, I can be like uncertain about if I'm doing the right thing. But then whenever I think about maybe how my songs could help bring people like closer toward like clarity, then it keeps me going with it. And oftentimes songs that aren't worship, but are just kind of um, like the father who loves you is calling you home is a line that is in one of my songs that I wrote and it just kind of started the song and, and kept it going. And so things like that, just those little lines that, you know, kind of will just catch you off guard during your day. Um, they help me like just one song for me will help me remember that even in my um, worldly songs that I can still be helping people with the right attitude, being like joyful and loving 
but also recognizing that, you know, in hard times, you need to recognize that it's a hard time. You don't have to fake, fake things, which has brought me a lot of clarity whenever I write like a sad song. Like you can't, you don't need to be ashamed about feeling sad because people all around the world are sad. And honestly, they need to know that more people are sad. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. whenever you're honest with your feelings and you write something meaningful toward you, even if it's not based on your faith, then, or if it's not about God, then it can still be about your faith and about what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I totally agree. I've never been able to write worship music um, or like specifically Christian music, just because I feel like I'm so tough on myself. And I'm like, none of this is good enough to be describing God. Like, for me, I just feel like there's a totally different bar set and like not necessarily actually a different bar set because I think come as you are, like that's just how, um, that's just how it is. But um, when you're talking about a relationship, like it's one person, it's a human being who's made mistakes, like it's your opinion. Um, and like nobody will ever really know who it's about or what it's about. Um, whereas like a worship song, like, people have to relate to it and people know who you're talking about. And if you don't do God justice, I almost feel like I'm like doing a disservice. And so I've never been able to write specific worship songs. Um, but I do think that my writing is influenced by my faith just because I think that me as a person and my story is influenced by my faith. And so when I'm writing a story, like my faith is interwoven. So like one of the songs that I have a line, it's like the Lord had me in mind when he made you. So it's like a love song, but at the same time, there's like little mentions of like faith and how that was orchestrated by a greater power. Yes. I answer. wrote, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Maria. Go ahead. Okay. I'm I was, I wrote a song this morning and that reminded me of what you were saying. And it was one of those where I was just sitting at the piano kind of with my head. I was like, mm -hmm. and mom would be like, you good? And I'd be like, <laughs> yeah. And I would just like start writing. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to tell a story. It's just a very true, true story that I've, I've met someone who I find very, really nice, you know, and I'm trying yeah. to just, <laughs> I'm trying to like keep my cool, you know, I'm trying mm -hmm. not to go all insane. And so that's something that like, I've grown a lot since high school, which was just a year ago, which is insane, but mm -hmm. keeping I'll myself as a... <laughs> No, Jack, I like, just wait. Yeah. <laughs> just knowing who I am mm -hmm. and not losing myself in other people mm -hmm. has been, and so I was trying to write a song about that, and I'll read the chorus. For some reason, I have it in front of me, but the chorus is talking about who I am. Um, the, the line that inspired this song, I know this is off topic, I'm sorry, but was, um, it's about me and like this very resentful feeling that I sometimes have towards my hometown and it has nothing to do with them. It's just me and like fear and that type of thing. But it, the line was, was she a person or just a character? They all know her life, but they don't know her. And so that's something that I've struggled with, like trying to move past and um, really accept people into my life and not have like um, this fear that they don't really care about who I am. That's just one thing that I struggle with. Like, but the, the chorus is, I have a heart and I have feelings. I have thoughts and fears within me, but I'm not two-dimensional. I have more sides and I'm not empty, I'm full. I am loved and I am not forgotten, the child of a father whose arms are wide open. Um, and I know my story isn't over, it's still writing. And so that could be taken so many different ways, just that one line, the child of a father whose arms are open, because a lot of people could think about their worldly father. But for me, every single one of those I am not or I am are because of that faith. And so for like, for me to know that maybe someday someone could sing those same words and um, know that like, that's kind of like my prayer to them, that even if they don't realize that that's what it's about at the time, that that will influence their life and that they'll know that they're loved and they're not forgotten and that they have a father who loves them, that type of thing. I was waiting to see if Jacqueline was going to say anything because I was curious because okay, the first line that you read, uh, Maria, can you read that one more time? The very first thing that you read? Um, the, the one that inspired the entire song? Oh, okay. Yeah. Was, she just a, was she a person or just a character? They all know her life, but they don't know her. Okay, so I want to use what you said to ask a devil's advocate question for you that I was hoping you were going to ask Jacqueline. 
So, Jack, I only ask this because I, I find there to be a lot of similarities between you and Maria, but you've mm -hmm. been gone from your hometown now, this area, for a while. Like, and I know that you live in Nashville now. I guess in a way of giving Maria advice for her songwriting and her on a personal level, what is it like now? Because I'm sure there's things that both of you miss about home. And there's things that I'm sure you were striving to get away from home about <laughs> because it's home and it's always been your life and you want to go see more now. That's why I like Jacqueline's response earlier after it's only been a year. But I guess going into this <laughs> year now, Jacqueline, and I yeah. can bring a former student on that's been out for 10 years mm -hmm. and they could probably say something too. But, you know, Jacqueline, when you look back on your hometown and the way, every, the way you felt people viewed you, you know, in Logan County, as great as the county place is, there's always frustrations with your home in small towns and whatnot. Um, when, when you look back, do you feel like a lot has changed in the way people view you have changed, the way you view, view, view yourself when it comes to your, your small town? So I guess I want to know is, has your own view of your town where you were from growing up, has it changed over time? And how has, has your view of yourself changed? Um, yes and no. Um... I think in a lot of ways, obviously, I've grown just because, um, I mean, I've changed sceneries. I've had to be on my own. I've met new people and people that situations I never encountered in a small town. And, and I'm so thankful for that because it helps me to really see a person for who they are and not our differences. Um, and so in a lot of ways, I'm so thankful um, for my time at Belmont. But at the same time, I'm still very thankful for my hometown um, because that was where it all started. Like that's um where I grew into who I was for a little bit just for it to get molded a little bit more and so um without that start I still wouldn't be who I am um but at the same time it is stressful because um going growing up in a small town everybody kind of knows everybody everyone has this idea of you like your reputation everyone always has one um and so in a way it was hard because when I decided to go off and do music that's not always the most popular opinion um for people everybody's always like what's your plan yeah to but Jack, you that's not the safe route to take. What, what are you doing oh no no it's definitely not the safe route um and yeah. that's why i feel like a lot of people were questioning it because they're like oh what are you actually going to do though like what's your plan b like you say you're going to do music but when you don't and fail at that like what are you actually going to do and no one says it in that word and nobody ever really i think means it necessarily in that way but music is one of the only careers where you're ever asked what your plan b is yeah. Um, and that's kind of disheartening in a way. And so for a while, I tried to avoid telling people how much music meant to me and how much um, like music had a role in my life and th that that was what I wanted to do. I'd always just go with something else. I'd be like, oh, I'm doing music business, business, <laughs> like calm down. It's just business um, because I felt like sometimes I was like disappointing people um, by choosing the path that I wanted to take. Um, and so coming to Nashville, I mean, it's Music City. So um, it's been really encouraging and also discouraging because you go from the only person doing music to being surrounded by people who do music. And so that's encouraging because you have people to bounce ideas off of, but then also there's a whole lot more comparison happening. And so you're like, well, everyone here is great. So like, maybe I'm not. And so like, it can be discouraging um, at times, but also like to know that you're not the only one out there that like loves music and like wants to do it. Um, so, I mean, there's both. I love my hometown and I love Nashville and I think I've grown through both places. Maria, do you want to add anything to that or respond to anything Jacqueline said? I think it's really interesting that you say that about Nashville because I so badly wanted to go to a school in Nashville, um, but it just came down to it and I didn't. And sometimes like I'll regret that or what, whatever, but I'll, but that's really interesting for you to, to say like that it's encouraging, but then it's sometimes discouraging that there's ups and downs of every single place. And um, I don't know, that's encouraging to me somehow. <laughs> yeah, well, good. <laughs> I, I like the fact that both of you are aware and you're critical of things that are justified to be critical of. But both of you, I, I consider to be good at what you do. I'm not saying you're experts at it, but you're good at it. But, I mean, on the other podcast that I do, we talk to Division I college athletes a lot. And one of the things that we constantly see is that every one of these girls on this volleyball team or softball team had video game statistics in high school. I'm talking like unreal 
mm-hmm. uh, kind of statistics, travel ball, that kind of stuff. And they get to college and they realize really quickly, I'm not the king. I mean, I'm not the, I'm a, I'm a small fish in a big pond now. Mm-hmm. Like every girl on this team is a beast. Every one of them were their best players on there. But they also recognize like Jack, when you were hitting that, how are you going to get better if you're not surrounded by other people that are going to push you to get better. Mm-hmm. I've always seen both of you, even when you were in high school, always had somewhat of that mentality too. It's weird to ask both of you in high school to, to look forward to some kind of scope of what your life's going to be like. But I think even Maria, you only being out a year from now, but Jacqueline definitely by now can tell that you can make mm-hmm. plans, but your plans don't always go accordingly. And you have to be willing to adjust pretty quickly. But I like the fact that both of you are willing to travel a lot and to explore and to get around people. And this is something that I'm giving credit to Maria on, too. I'm not dogging Belmont because Belmont is great. But many people criticize Western Kentucky because they say it's too close to home. And I'm going to see many people that I know. But you probably know by now, Maria, at least when you were at school, it's a big university. And you meet a lot of different people around the world that go there, you don't have to just be around the people you grew up with. So my thing is you can get that globalization and that experience really well from that. Um, Just to to segue again on another level, I mean, this is a philosophy podcast and both of you, I appreciate your personal philosophy towards songwriting. So I'm going to bring up a philosophical word that I forgot to use in your class, Maria, back in the day, but I started using last year with my last humanities class and that's a philosophical word that you two may have heard before called escapism have either one of you heard of escapism before i mean it's basically exactly what it sounds like is that we all have jobs to do i don't know while you're in college if you two have been working at all but i i I told you before i had a lot of weird jobs i was a butcher before in the past (laughs) i did comedy i was a grocery store manager i did i had to go through a lot of weird stuff to get to be a teacher but you do a lot of stuff you know, in job wise to get kind of where you want to be someday, maybe even starting at the bottom of the rung and working your way up. But most of us regular people have jobs to worry about. So whenever we come home, we want to escape. We want to have an escapism of some kind. For some people, it's video games. For some people, it's sports, playing them, watching them, fandom, all this kind of stuff. So I want to know when it comes to music for each of you, because my next episode is going to be based on work, as you two heard earlier. And I think this is a good kind of a tie-in to that episode about how should we define work. And one of the questions that I wonder if either one of you have ever had is you're good at music, you like music, and you will write it. How do you find the balance between it feeling too much like work, which I, I don't necessarily think of that as bad. People always use the word work as though it's always negative. Uh-huh. It's something that you get really valuable things out of work. But how do you find a balance between is music an escape for you or does it feel like a job for you? Or is it is a little bit of a balance between both? Um, I think it's kind of a balance between both. I always go back to the quote, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. Um, and so I never want music or writing to feel like a chore. And that goes back to what we talked about earlier with when I feel writer's blog or when I feel like it becomes like a struggle. I don't want to force myself to finish it because I don't want it to feel like homework. Um, And so in that, I like to let it kind of, when I'm inspired, when I feel like I want to finish it, because I never want to get so structured with it that it becomes a chore. Um, Because I think in that, it kind of takes away what I love about it. So I'm sort of the same way. Um, But for me, I feel like I'm also maybe a little bit more sporadic than you are. Um, And so often like, like I said, I'll, I'll take steps back. Like maybe I won't write for a couple weeks. Um, but I'm really bad. (laughs) I can communicate how I feel much better than in a song than I could ever just tell you. So that's why I'm saying this. (laughs) I wrote a song, (laughs) spoiler alert. I wrote a song the other night. Um, and it kind of explains how it feels to me right now with even thinking about what do I want to do? Like, what do I want my day job to be? That type of thing. Um, someone was asking me about it and I said, I texted them, I have a lot of dreams and sometimes I think that they're going to fall together eventually. And so then I was like, Hey, that kind of sounds poetic. And so I wrote about it. And, um, that's how I feel a lot about songwriting is that, I have a lot of dreams, whether it's um, 
writing a song that someone hears on the radio someday or writing a song for someone that they'll hear, you know, or, you know, any of that or starting my own business. I have a lot of, I have a lot of passions. I'm not just a songwriter. I, I'm excited about a lot of things in life. I'm excited about starting a family and, you know, meeting someone that is like on the same page with me when it comes to that kind of stuff. And, um, so I have this, I have this dream, this music dream, but I also have a lot more dreams. And so I feel like this past summer, especially in this quarantine, I have found this balance between realizing that maybe not all dreams happen at once, or maybe not all of your dreams like come true, but they blend together and for a greater purpose than whatever I think. Like I think about Proverbs 19.21 that says, um, many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it's the purpose of the Lord that prevails. And I've been repeating that to myself. And I think it's finally kind of clicking that I have a lot of plans. I have a lot of dreams and I literally have no idea which way to go, which road to take. But knowing that in the end, if I'm walking in the path with like, if I'm walking with the spirit, then I'm walking towards something greater than what I can imagine. And so um, getting like worked up about a song that doesn't work right, or maybe a job that I don't get or um, anything like that. I've learned to let it become part of my walk instead of a roadblock, if that makes sense. And so music doesn't ever feel like work to me anymore. And I feel like um, maybe in high school it did just because I felt pressure from people. Once they figured out that I was a songwriter, I was like, Oh, I got to do this. Um, but once I got out of high school, I kind of took a step back and realized like it's importance to me and that other people's opinions about what I write um, don't determine what I write and when I write it, that it in the long run is up to me. And that hopefully these dreams that I have, they're going to blend together. And if not one of them comes true, then it's going to be a little bit of everything. <laughs> no, it's, it's a really well stated thing, Maria, because it makes me think of, you know, other people don't define the substance of your writing because you're the one mm -hmm. that defines what that means to you. And I think that's very admirable to ask. I, I have something that I want to show to each of you. This is going to feel like you're back in my classroom again. So <laughs> this is purely just when I read it to you and I'm going to put it in the chat so you two can actually read it. For the listeners, I'll put this quote in the description for YouTube and I'll put it in the sound or the SoundCloud and Spotify and Apple description as well, so you can see it. I just want to know, Maria and Jacqueline, does this quote from Socrates speak to both of you? Do you agree with them? That's all I'm asking mm -hmm. is if you agree with it. So I'm going to read it to you. Socrates, and this is, of course, we don't really have anything in writing by Socrates. All we know about Socrates is what Plato said, because Plato was his student. But according to Plato, Socrates said, musical training is a more potent instrument than any other because rhythm and harmony find their way into the inward places of the soul on which they mightily fasten imparting grace and making the soul of him who is rightly educated graceful or of him who is ill-educated ungraceful. So I just want to know, you know, he's basically saying that musical training and in the, in to the extent that both of you have had so far in your life, just think about how much you're going to add later on to it. To Socrates, he's basically saying that, that education that an individual has gained, rightly so, has hit them deeply, like to, to the point of the soul. Now, I know Socrates is before Christianity of that because there's the multiple gods of the Greeks. And that, but the, the aspect of the idea of the soul is still there. Do you think, and I know this is getting into faith again, does that hit home with both of you? Did you, did you relate to what Socrates said? Yes, definitely. <laughs> I'm like thinking about, like I can just like speak words and I'm kind of focusing on just the very beginning of it, that quote, but like I can just, I can speak poetry and I think it has a lot of, um, like it can impact someone, but whenever you put um, a melody to it, a lot of times, I don't know, it just, it creates a new meaning. And I feel like, but I don't know what it is about harmonies and melodies that connect two people's souls, but I can like, um, I'm going to go Acapulco here, Acapulco. But I said earlier, the father who loves you is calling you home. And that's a powerful statement. But if I sing it like this, the father who loves you is calling you home. It creates a whole new meaning. And because I can say that all day, 
but whenever I sing it, that's whenever I feel it. I don't know if that makes sense. And I don't know if everyone is like that, but just adding, adding a musical component to words that are meaningful, I feel like it really makes people sit and think about them more because they hear people talking all day long. But whenever you play something to them, then, <laughs> then it's something that they actually care about a little bit more. Music really relates to people. Mm-hmm. That was a no, great point, agree. Maria, about adding that to it. Uh, same over to you, Jacqueline, about mm-hmm. did, did that quote relate to you? Yeah, I mean, I agree with what uh, a lot of what Maria said. Um, just that music, I think you can hear somebody talking all the time um, and you can make the same point. Um, but for me, the music part of it is what brings the emotion and what brings the passion to it. Um, like if I sing something, just like she said, um, for me, I feel like I'm able to convey a lot more emotion and meaning behind the words than I am if I just were to say it. So, And both of you, I completely agree with you. And I'm not a musically inclined person, but even that makes sense to me. It hits home to me. For some reason, both of your answers, and especially Maria giving that example of singing a cappella was great on there because you're right, it does add something mm-hmm. different to the feeling. Um, I asked the same question back when, when Jacqueline was a freshman and Maria through the two or three years that I had you, I would ask this question every year and I think I started asking it with Jacqueline's class or, or her sisters. And that was one of the philosophy questions about music was in a song, which is more important, the music or the lyrics? And I, if, I could, if I could remember, I'm a pretty good visual learner. I know Maria brought this up, but Jacqueline is much further back. But I thought <laughs> that in the end, Jacqueline would at least agree to this if she didn't bring it up herself. And that is, I have a hard time answering that question because, Maria, you, you told your class that junior year, you can't really have one without the other. Like, you, they, they both help each other. And you talked about how important the melody is along with the lyrics. That's on there. And it's not to say classical music with no lyrics is not powerful and it's not important. But I, I loved how you took riding the fence as something that was, you know, you're really good points to make. Are you worried about the spider? <laughs> you're like looking for that spider. Like, ah. Y'all, it, oh my God. Yeah, it's just like she was like looking all confident the whole episode and now the spider's real close. I'm like, sorry. No, it's okay. We're almost done with the first segment. Now, the, we're going to go ahead and do one more question. Now, I know I went way off base of what our original roadmap was on these questions, but I know Maria's a note taker, and I know Jacqueline is just shooting from the hip here. Yeah. So before we go to our last segment, which the last month and a half I've been doing this new segment where it's called The Thoughtful Three, you two will think it's a breeze because you lived it yourself. So I always ask my guests three random Fill the philosophy questions that they had no prep on. And it's just your quick gun, but you two have had plenty of training on this before. You guys will be great. We'll take a little bit of a break for that segment before we do that. But I'll ask you both one more question. And I'm, I'm trying to tie in basically the, the last six or seven that I was going to ask you. you. You, of course, answered some of those that we had planned. But this is me giving each of you a platform. Whenever you knew that I asked you a week ago to be on this episode or asked you in the past to be on an episode before, surely between then and now, you've been probably thinking about, well, what am I going to say about songwriting? What am I going to think about? Is there anything now? This is your chance. If, if there's anything that I haven't really brought up or hasn't, I haven't asked you specifically that before the show tonight, you going in, you're like, I really do want to share this. It would mean a lot to me to say this for myself or for other people to hear just this is your last chance to have a platform just to kind of say anything about songwriting that you would want to say and what it means to you or what you want people to know about you and what, what your experiences have been. And uh, I'll, but it's, I'll, I'll let you guys are great at just bouncing off each other. So whoever wants to go first, just go ahead. I'll go. <laughs> okay. Yeah, like, I was like girl. looking at you. I was like, I don't think you can tell. Yeah. But. <laughs> Both of you are too polite. Go ahead. Um, what something that I want to say is, I think I've maybe said it before, but just to reiterate how important it is to keep your ears open, um, and ears can be metaphorically too. Like maybe keep your keep your eyes up. Like everything can inspire a song if you're wanting to write a song. If it's a text message, like the one that I sent to someone that I was like, wait, that kind of sounds poetic. Let me backtrack a little bit and write that down again. Um, Just keep your ears open and um, don't underestimate like just your thoughts. Um, If you're feeling something 
and you're thinking something, write it down. You don't have to think that it's a song right now, but just go ahead and write down, write whatever you're feeling. And then later you can go back and you can look at it and try to work something out through that. But yes, don't underestimate um, conversations with people. Um, you, you can be inspired all the time. Just keep your ears open and your eyes open and um, just be looking. Always be looking. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess mine would probably be just to reiterate again, like that quote that I said, just because it literally has changed um, my opinion of my writing and how I write is that Ed Sheeran quote about the faucet of when you first turn it on, it's going to be filthy and dirty and your songs are going to be the best. But like the longer you leave it on, the clearer the water gets, the more precise you get and the more people are going to be able to take from it. Um, and so that just genuinely changed so much from what I did. Cause I was always so hard on myself. I'm a perfectionist. And so at some points I was like, these aren't any good. Like, why do I even continue to try? Um, but just being able to see that growth from the beginning and be reminded that like, yeah, I mean, no, they weren't very good, but you were also like 16 when you wrote that. So like, there isn't that much that a 16 year old can say that a 30 year old, you know, is going to relate to. Um, and even now, you know, so, um, just being patient with yourself and like understanding that there's growth to be had, but also just because it's not good to everyone doesn't mean that it's not good and healthy for you to do it. So I'm not saying either to like, wait until you're older, um, to write, because for me, some of those songs I would never show to anyone. Like the first song I ever wrote, never shown it to anybody. But for me, that was a really important moment at that point. And so, to look back and be like, wow, that's what I thought. Like, that was my emotion. That's how, where my heart was. And like, looking back now, I see the whole situation for what it was. But in that moment, it kind of brings me back to that mindset, brings me back to that memory. And so just keep up and try not to be too hard on yourself because like songwriting is beautiful. Like, let it be what it is. Mm-hmm. Just write that's something wonderful. that means something to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wonderful advice for both of you. No matter what the theme is or genre or the topic, I think that, even if somebody was writing, let's just say hip hop, they could still get substance out of this episode. Mm-hmm. There's still lyrical writing and, and all that kind of thing. I respect what both of you say. My last advice for each one of you before we do the last segment, which is just something I've been thinking about the whole night that we've been going through the podcast. You know, when I listen to musicians that I'm a big fan of that songwrite, one of the things that I really appreciate uh, about the ones that have grown older, like a John Mayer, a Justin Furstenfeld that have grown around my age or so is how their songs and their albums change so much over time. I love looking at an anthology of somebody and seeing how their songs change. And what I can't wait to see is, I'm not saying that you and Jacqueline need to be in a hurry for this, Maria, but I know in this area we live at, people tend to, to get married as though it's a competition, like they're trying to get married as fast as they can. But I will say, and it's nothing against them, when you know you're in love, and by all means, mm-hmm. go for it. But I, I will say is that, there are all these benchmark moments that for all I know right now, neither one of you are married yet, but you might get married someday. You might get your <laughs> first home someday, have your first children, get your first career, um, you know, fall in love, fall out of love. You know, there's, there's going to be suffering and there's going to be like successes all the way, but I can't wait to see how the substance of your songs change over time. Like the way these people do. And the cool thing about what Jacqueline said there at the end too, is you look back at 16, Jacqueline, but what, what is 30-year-old Jacqueline going to think when she looks back mm-hmm. at what 16-year-old road version wrote? And you're like, what, 21 now, I think, mm-hmm. or close to that? Yeah, 21. So believe it or not, when you're 30 or 36 like I am, you're going to look back on 21-year-old Jacqueline and go, what was I thinking? Yeah. <laughs> or, yeah. Or you might even be, it's weird mm-hmm. to think that, but it's just going to be cool to see uh, how, and especially I love the fact that neither one of you plan on stopping anytime mm-hmm. soon. You should keep doing it. As long as it gives you joy, you should keep doing that. But I would love to, to have this conversation again someday. Maybe even have another person or, or a couple in there. I'm, I'm going to do a part two with a couple of other people that do what you guys do too as well. I, I, I would highly, I mean, would, would both of you be willing to come back again later? Oh, yeah, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, let, I'll let Maria get close to her senior year of college and have her come back <laughs> yeah. again after going through mm-hmm. that. And Jack, and after being in your career for a while, and I, I only hope, of course, I know what people mean when you said that earlier, Jacqueline. People are not necessarily being cynical on purpose. Oh, yeah. They may be skeptical, mm-hmm. but people mm-hmm. just want you to succeed. And you you could have a full career, and you could be a career in music and still be doing the business side of it. Mm-hmm. But I just hope that both of you are doing what means a lot to you. And, of course, I hope you to be successful as a musician. And if you have a safety net, if you have a backup plan, then great. 
but also keep doing what means a lot to you. And that, mm-hmm. that's great. We're going to take a little bit of a break because I need to take Walter out, my dog. And then we're going to come <laughs> back to the last segment doing the Thoughtful Three. Other than that, Jacqueline, Maria, I really appreciated your time and everything. And like I said, we'll be right back with just a little bit of a jingle on the uh, SoundCloud. <laughs> Okay, Philosophs, welcome back to our second and last segment of the show, just the, the thoughtful three questions. I'm going to finish the show by really asking Maria and Jacqueline um, three questions. And, and again, both of them could answer each question, but I'm going to make one of them start off on each particular one. So Maria, I'm going to start with you first. These are questions that are very similar to what you had done back when you were students of mine. But again, these are not meant for you to like overly think about it. Just kind of say what comes to your mind. And then Jacqueline can kind of reiterate what she would say for the same kind of question. And it's just a fun way to end our show. We try to end every show with a little bit of philosophy at the very end of it. So along our same topic today. So Maria, you're first. The question is, does inspiration come to a person or is it found through searching? I think before I can overthink it my answer would be that inspiration come well actually I don't know because I'm going back around I was going to say inspiration comes to a person but then also earlier I was saying that sometimes I don't want to be inspired and so I'll like shut myself off from being inspired and lately I felt really inspired but also I think it has to do with me being more open right now I feel pretty like confident and I want to be inspired to write and so you know that's a good question Malcolmson that's a really good question my instinct would definitely be just to, would be that inspiration comes to a person mm-hmm. like yeah woo, there it is I'm inspired but also I think you have to be open to it to really um or maybe it's you have to be open to inspiration to recognize it I think you can be inspired all the time or inspiration could be coming to you, but unless you are open for them, maybe you're not searching for inspiration, but you're more open to recognize them. Maybe that's it also sounds like the same advice people give for like relationship stuff. It's like when you try really hard to find a boyfriend or a girlfriend, it seems impossible, but it's like when you least expected some opportunity pops up, but yeah. I like it because, Maria, you and Jacqueline both said it towards the end of that first segment that you do need to keep your mind open. You do need to seek opportunities and travel and, and be open to me, to spending time with your friends. You never know where inspiration is going to come from. But I like Maria, you kind of say it's a little bit of both. Like you could be trying to just forget about it, but at the same time, by just living your life in some way, it's kind of coming to you. Maybe it's a little bit of uh, being able to recognize it whenever it's there. It's, it's yeah. very challenging. Jacqueline, what would you say to that same question? Um, I agree with a lot, a lot of what Maria said. I think, too, in both ways, I think I would lean more towards that inspiration comes to you. Um, just because I have been a few days and when I've been writing, um, I feel like it just, it's there. Like, it's either there or it's not. Um, and when I try to find it is when it gets pulled in like the fewest ways I've ever been. It just doesn't measure up as well um, as to when it comes to me. That's good. Well, Jacqueline, I hope that our listeners are really good at reading lips because it sounds like you're really far away from the I audience. can't hear anything. Yeah, no, Maria was like, huh, like she's trying to get her Civil War horn out and trying to smash her hair. <laughs> well, no, not really. I mean, it's still really deep. Now, it's okay, Jacqueline. Go ahead and answer it because I can try to amplify the sound whenever you talk. And it's just going to be the last segment here. It's just a little bit of doing that. I'll tell you what, for your sake, nothing gets Maria. I'll have Maria go answer on these, and then I'll have you follow up on the answers. But we'll, we'll kind of stick with the same pattern that we're doing, and we'll kind of see how it goes. But, I, again, on the audio part, I'll go ahead and amplify it so people can have it here. Um, Jack, I'll just go ahead and have you go first anyway because it doesn't matter. So your question is, um, will, I'm sorry, will creativity ever hit a ceiling? thinking she was like it's just amazing that like all these songs just continually get written um and then she's like you think all the concepts are taken up and then there's another one you're like wow where did that come from so I don't think there is because I think there's always going to be a new perspective to every situation 
Um, and so I think that because there's an infinite number of people um, that are going to be coming later on that have, were, there's always new stories. And so even though we might be talking about the same concept, it's always going to be a different perspective and a different take on it. You're muted. Yeah, I got it, Maria. Jack, I hope people watch the YouTube channel just to hear not only your answer, but to watch Maria Wells, like, <laughs> literally become enlightened because she went from hearing nothing. And I, I don't know what it is about Zoom, Jacqueline, but they must must mm-hmm. hate your headphones. As you were do. talking, it was like you were coming down a tunnel or a hallway. It just kept getting louder and louder and louder and louder. So and weird. Then now, yeah, now it's just perfect again. But Maria's mm-hmm. face, when it, when it got full volume, she's like, <laughs> it's, just, it's like this huge shock. That oh, it, I love that. <laughs> no, I, I like Jacqueline. It, it's, it's cool that you said that you've thought about that question before, mm-hmm. about having a hit kind of ceiling. And I, I think it goes really well with when you and Maria were t- discussing about what it's like to have writer's block or to get stuck. And uh, I'm sure sometimes you, I mean, have you and Maria ever got to any point in your life when it comes to your songwriting where you started to second guess yourself a little? Like you, maybe you started to second guess, am I really meant to be doing this? Before I let Maria go, Jacqueline, like, could you answer that first? Like, have, have you ever gone through that? Oh, yeah. Um, so many times, like, honestly, I've tried to put music on the back. They're like, I'll listen to everybody else. And I'm like, something else is easier. Something else is meant to happen. And like, I keep getting brought back to it. Um, but for sure, 100%. Um, like, I had something else and I totally just blanked on what it was. So maybe it'll come back to me in a minute. But yeah, um, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And then Maria, the same question to you, Maria. Um, will creativity ever hit a ceiling? And uh, I also want to ask you about the stuck thing. Whenever you have been stuck in the past, has that caused you to kind of second guess your own skills? That's definitely something that I've thought about before. Like I've kind of asked myself that question and it kind of goes along with what your, your second question. I think I kind of second guess um, how we can keep coming up with creative things. Like everything that's, um, that everything that's happened. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. Okay, I'm sorry. Everything that's happened, um, so like so far, like it's just the same stuff happening again, just to other people, and that's something that I kind of say to myself whenever I feel discouraged in my own songwriting. Like, why do I have any more of a right to write about this than anyone else? Like, why is my take on it gonna be um, going to connect with anyone else more than someone else's take? If that makes sense. But then it's the exact same thing as what Jacqueline was saying. The part that I heard there at the end, <laughs> there's so many people in this world and everyone's background, everyone, where, they, where they're where they from, um, their family, life, what it was like, um, their religion, every everyone is unique. Even if you have a twin, Occamson, <laughs> you know that, you know, maybe your genetics, completely same. Y'all are two completely different people though. And which is just another thing that's just amazing to me that everyone is unique. And so it also, that's, that's important to me to remember that everyone is unique. And Mm -hmm. if everyone is unique, that means I'm unique too. And so my take on something is, you know, just as important as someone else's take on it. And we're never going to run out of takes because, you know, population is still rising. (laughs) Mm -hmm. People are still being born in different places and different families and they're learning new things at different times than other people are. So I don't think, I don't think it does. It's just Mm -hmm. people find new ways to express how they feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I finally remember what I was going to say. And uh, Maria reminded me that like um, for songwriting, for the longest time, I wanted to be an artist even before I started songwriting. Um, And I kept hearing over and over that like, as an artist, you need to have something to say. Um, Because if you don't have anything to say, nobody's going to listen. And so that's kind of where I started my songwriting um, not really intentionally so that I could be a better artist, just because to me, it helps me as a human being, but like, um, being able to have something specific to say and having your own take on it. Um, everybody has something to say, or like, like she said, we're all unique. Um, and so we just have to find that. And so when I have writer's block, um, or I can't figure out what I want to say, it's frustrating because I'm like, I have a voice. What is it that I'm trying to say here? Um, but I don't know. Yeah. It's just really important for 
every person to know that their voice is valued and that they do have something to say and it's going to be important to somebody. So. You know, that's another one of those things that you and Maria bring up more from the show that we covered and believe it or not, we actually recorded an hour and 45 minutes. I don't know if it felt like that. That was, that was a long <laughs> discussion for just three people. But mm-hmm. both of you said so many valuable things throughout the discussion. Um, and I think that both of you are hitting on one of the themes was don't quit your options. Don't stop traveling. Don't stop spending time with people because that ceiling is just going to keep expanding and you're never really going to hit it if you continue to keep going out. Don't just close yourself off not just physically, but I mean your ideas, like get to know more things. And I respect both of you for saying that. At the same time, we go back to that really difficult question that both of you handled gracefully earlier about sensationalism, is that you both are doing a tug of war or a little bit of a tightrope walk over, how can I make these lyrics relate to people, but how do I keep them from being too vanilla? Uh, but, But they're also unique. They're also personal to me. And you have to fight with do I share this? Do I feel confident with it now? And, um, and so both of you admit that when it comes to the ceiling thing, is it, does a little bit, bit of that involve just um, insecurity in a way? Because both of you have always been confident people, but we're all insecure. Does, does insecurity play a role in someone feeling as though they've hit a ceiling? Definitely. I think for sure. Yeah. Um, just because, like I said, it's, it's telling a piece of who you are, whether that's your story, someone else's, something you've made up, regardless, it's something that you've created. And so there's always going to be a little bit of vulnerabil- vulnerability in that. Um, and so sometimes it's like you can't find the words because you're too scared to write the ones that you want. Um, and so like that's where sometimes I hit the ceiling. That's one of the best quotes I, I think I've heard from the show tonight, that you might mm-hmm. be too scared to really write what you want to write. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's the same you know, concept of like, you don't want to admit to yourself um, that this not, is not good for you or that this is not something you need to be doing or that you need to change paths. It's the same concept of like, sometimes it is hard to just like realize that that is fact, like that's how it was. And so um, just being able to admit that um, can often just lead to a lot of growth, like even if nobody else was to ever hear it. Mm-hmm. That's great. I like it. Because I, I, you, you're going to answer my follow-up, Jacqueline, because I was going to ask, well, what is it that you're afraid of mm-hmm. or an individual has fear of? But it's not just sharing the song and what other people will think. It's mostly what you think. Like, can, can mm-hmm. you self-reflect on it? Can you recognize that this is something that is important to you or really is bothering you or whatever it might be? Maria, do you want to follow up with anything of what Jacqueline said? Um, just that um, whenever you have a song that's meaningful, meaningful to meaningful to you, um, kind of, kind of what you were talking about, Jacka, and, and just kind of going back to earlier. Um, I lost my train of thought. I think I think you can tell all all three of us are <laughs> that fatigue now. I mean, when was the last time we were told? To <laughs> I'm trying to remember. I, it was it was gonna it was along the line of sensationalism. Ooh. Almost dropped something. My cat just got my hands. Okay. <laughs> um, whenever you're, whenever you have a song that you really connect with, you don't have to share it. Um, or maybe it means something to you at the time. But whenever you're, maybe it's not you're afraid to release it because it means so much to you. But you're, you also realize that maybe that wasn't your best state of mind. Like maybe I, you wrote that and you were in a, like a revengeful place or, you know, you were just kind of. <laughs> just like, there's different things making noises in Maria's house that's just attacking her all the time. My cat just <laughs> set off the um, automatic vacuum. Oh, Sorry nice. Sorry about that. <laughs> you, just, you can just cut that part out. No, that's great. No, it's okay. We need to keep it in there. It makes it more <laughs> like organic. It, it's, a, it's a great experience. Uh, so... Let's do our last question. This is actually my favorite one. And I thought if there's any question I can finish tonight, that whenever both of you leave and you go away into songwriting more in the future, I, I hope it is something you still consider because I, this is a question that I'm going to ask my students this year. You know the life questions that I always give at the beginning of the year? This is one of the new ones that's added that's going to drive them crazy. So pretend <laughs> I have 15-year-olds that have never been asked this before. And it's such a <laughs> short question. And as Maria knows, Sometimes the shortest ones are the hardest, like what is good and what is bad and what is the truth. 
So here's your version for two creative people that I know. And your last question, and either one of you can take it, but it's for both of you to answer. And that is, what is simple? Um, for me, I guess, simple, when I think of simple, I think of easy. Um, just because we have been talking about songwriting, but like, um, when something's simple, it's like easy to understand. It's not super complex. It kind of like it flows. It's easy. Um, and so sometimes something that's super simple um, can be the most profound because it is so easy to understand. Um, and it's something that's not necessarily always said. So like, just like the word good is used all the time, but when it's used in certain contexts, it means so much more. Um, I don't know. Just, Yeah. <laughs> I like what you said there. Simple is not complex. It's like saying what it's not. So saying what it is like simple is it's not complicated. Mm -hmm. Simple is um, not. It's not worrying. Whenever it's simple, it shouldn't be something that you're um, concerned about. It's that it's something that, you know, I mm -hmm. don't know. Like yeah. whenever I think about I've, this is actually a conversation that I've had with my mom recently. Um, or maybe it was mom my best friend, where I was saying that it's simple. I was like, don't worry about it. I was like, some things really are just that simple, you know, that you don't have to overthink it. But she kind of re retorted back at me. I can't even remember who it was that actually everything is complicated. Even the simple things are complicated. And so I think that's an interesting because I totally don't think like that. Some things I just think that's just the way it is. And like whenever you're, I don't know. I'm a little bit romantic, I guess. But whenever you meet someone and you like them, that's all that it is at the beginning, you know? You like yeah. somebody. Like, it's simple. It's nice. Well, you're, you're <laughs> then the, whenever you start to get uh, into it, it gets complicated. So you know? you're saying that whether it's a romantic relationship or just a friendship, when you make a relationship in the beginning on the onset, is it rather simple? And does it, And if so, does it become more complex over time? Or is it always simple? I think that it becomes more complex because it has more layers to it. Whereas at the beginning, maybe you like kind of what I was saying earlier, you know, my favorite color, you know, my, like, my grandparents' names, my favorite book, like these things that make you connect with each other that are just very simple. And then you start adding things on to each other and maybe it becomes more layered and more complex. But maybe the fact that maybe the thing that connected you at the beginning is carried with you throughout the whole thing which therefore reminds you that it really is simple that maybe, which obviously I'm not there yet. I'm not, I'm not married or anything. So, <laughs> but whenever it comes to friendships, like, Oh, Addie White, we were best friends whenever we were in like the third grade when I moved to Lewisburg and we'd known each other before that um, through our parents. So we would go watch the Super Bowl together and we were friends and we would spend the night with each other. Just very simple. That's just life as a kid. And then whenever it starts to grow, we know more about each other. We confide in each other. But throughout these years, I will still call her my best friend. And whenever I think of Addie, I don't think of Addie as this 18-year-old um, um, who's going to Murray and all of this mature stuff. I think it's Addie, my best friend, you know? Like, you know, it's, it's just simple. That's who she is. And so I think that you can make things more complex um, throughout the years. But at the same time, I think some things are just simple. If it's how you feel, then that's how you feel. I don't know. <laughs> right. that, that was good. Both of you did great. Neither one of you are implying necessarily that simplicity is negative, mm -hmm. nor are you implying, and I don't mean complexity as negative either. I'm not saying that, you know, people often say, well, relationships become complicated because at first you're in the euphoric what we call the flirtation ship stage where you're just kind of like talking, everything seems new and great, but you know, you, you get, things get more seemingly complicated when you move in together, you have kids together, you're getting married and you do all these things and, and more adult like problems have, but you have a good point. It doesn't necessarily mean that this is necessarily being complicated. And if it is, it's not necessarily bad, but I also like Maria, where you said even simple things or things that seem simple. What the, the thing I like the most about what you and Jacqueline said you guys will mention that certain things are simple. However, it doesn't make it less important just because it mm -hmm. seems simple. Like 
when you said, uh, can you remind me again, Maria, that, that song that you, you came, you were at the church camp or retreat, and you had that, that two-word title. Did you have a two-word title for it? What yes. was it? Good Grief. Good Grief. Okay. Very simple. It seems very simple title, but there's more substance to that title than what it really is on the surface, right? Mm -hmm. And it's just like anything, the way people label each other. To say Addie's your best friend is not just putting a label on her. There's so many things you've gone through since third grade that make that. Or Jacqueline and Lydia, her friend, there's so many things they've gone through <laughs> that, that tie them together. It's not to say that you don't have other really close friends either. I'm just saying in those examples you're given, that should hit at home with both of you on that and, and it's great too i know you brought up the twin thing earlier and it's the same thing kind of with me too is that we have the same dna and that in itself may seem simple but we're still two complicated different people and it's all really cool to go so we're going to go to the closing segment i always do this and i have one last question for you to answer while you're giving your closing thoughts and jacqueline's like jesus no. <laughs> no, it's okay but so uh, what, what i always like to end on i've been asking I do this every year before school starts. I pick 10 to 15 or 20 students that I used to have and I find them on social media. And I just, I, I, I send them a message saying like, you know, I'm checking in on you. How are things going? 99% of the time they're great. Things are fine. But then every once in a while I'll meet somebody that really does need someone to talk to or someone to kind of bounce ideas off of. So I'm about to start doing that as I'm two weeks away from kids actually being at school again. And uh, so I ask you to, the same question Maria's thing cut out. So I asked Jacqueline, Maria might be coming back on. Maybe her phone died. <laughs> <laughs> Jacqueline, I'll just ask you this, and if she comes back on, we'll, we'll get that later. So Jacqueline, um, how did you feel being on your first podcast ever? And the only other question I have for you last would be, what have you learned about yourself while doing songwriting? So since high school, and you combine songwriting mm -hmm. on top of that, I always ask former students of mine, what have you learned about your, hey, there she is, <laughs> she's coming back on. I'll give her a chance to do it. Maria, I'm going to go ahead and repeat the question for you. I know you Sorry. had a little technology trouble. It's okay. Is that I just want to know two things. One is, what did you think about being on your first podcast that you've ever been on? Secondly, what have you learned about yourself as a songwriter? And what have you learned about yourself since high school? I'll start with Jacqueline. Okay. Um, I love the podcast. I mean, I love talking about all the things with songwriting and music. Um, and I actually don't get to talk about it a lot. Um, just because I am, I tend to be a little bit more private with my writing. Um, and so I have to be really comfortable with someone before I'm like, yeah, I wrote this new song. Do you want to hear it? And, um, so getting to hear about the concepts and the ideas behind songwriting, especially with another songwriter is like really important. I was actually talking to my roommate about something similar last night. So, um, it was really fun, but, um, just, being able to talk to people with like light minds and open minds about creativity and songwriting and what role that's played in their life is just a really fun opportunity that even though I have a lot of friends in Nashville that um, are into music, not a lot of them write. And so um, being able to talk to another writer is just awesome. I mean, I love it about some ideas, how you write the process, everything like that, because for me in a small town, nobody else, ever wrote growing up so I just kind of was winging it nobody taught me how it was just kind of what felt right for me and so it's always fun to like compare process uh songwriting processes with another person um but as far as growth I feel like I've grown so much more than I ever thought I would through college um and through writing and that's it goes back to why I date um my songs is to see that growth and so I can go back to songs that were back from 2016 17 whenever um and then I'll go to a song that I wrote last week and you can like even whether that's situational or just how it's written, seeing that growth is really encouraging because you can get stuck in that mindset of picking the flaws out of what you've just done and what you've just created instead of seeing the whole picture of until just now, this wasn't a thing. Um, and seeing that as the importance that it is and seeing the growth that you've come through. Um, so for music, I feel like I've definitely grown a lot, but also as just a person and seeing the world and experiencing new things and developing my own ideas um, in new places has just been huge in shaping who I am. I've really enjoyed this conversation because like you said, I don't talk to people about songwriting very much at all. Um, because I don't feel like I'm around songwriters or really just musicians in general. And whenever I write, um, often I'm just by myself. Um, kind of like, I'm just going to do my own thing. I think this is how it's supposed to sound like, who knows? Mm -hmm. Um, 
so it's really cool getting to like hear about your process too and also your questions have been really thoughtful and like thought provoking and mm-hmm. so I've like enjoyed talking to someone who has literally no idea about it too and like seeing what you think about it <laughs> um growth wise I've only been out of high school for a year but at the same time I feel like it's been way longer which is weird it's a weird feeling but I feel like the most that I've grown or the thing that I've learned about myself um is that I think I mentioned it a little bit earlier but that I can be myself and not um be I don't have to let other people's like opinions about me affect who I am like and not to say that some opinions are bad because I think a lot of opinions matter and it's important to listen to those things and you know, take criticism about and learn more about who you are through that. But at the same time, often I feel like in the past in high school, especially I would like just lose myself in people and just completely, it's just kind of like, yeah, whatever you say, that's what, that's who I am. Mm -hmm. But knowing that separating myself from high school and um, kind of just studying the Bible a lot more for me, at least um, kind of told me who I am. Like um, I am loved I'm not forgotten, that type of thing. I'm not alone. Um, Just knowing that I am known by someone who loves me more than anyone could ever love me in the world, my future husband, you know, anyone, um, that is freeing for me at least. And so whenever I am intimidated by maybe like a new colleague or anything like that, I have, I felt so much more comfortable now that I have really come to terms with the fact that no matter what their opinion of me is, if they like me at first, if they never like me, you know, that type of thing, that I am known by someone who loves me more than they'll ever understand how to love. So that's really what's influenced me past high school, just this past year. That's great. I I highly admire and respect both of you, both your thoughts on on growth, the way other people view you, the way you view yourself. You know, I, I admire that both of you are willing to share your faith background. I know that in high school, both of you can agree that you had a lot of students of faith, but you also had a lot of skeptical students. And sometimes I always get the feeling that it was almost even harder for those of you students that were more religious to feel comfortable saying uh, things about your faith in school because you felt like there was maybe more criticalness there. I admire the fact that at your church and, and high school students have this too, that you do get these opportunities to sit together to discuss really meaningful ethical things from a Christian view. But this is the I don't know if it's been to a failure. Sometimes it does feel like I'm fighting a war that I'm destined to lose on. But I always ask myself, why can't we do these things at school too? Why, why do I only need to rely on Maria or Jacqueline at church to have those meaningful discussions? Why can't I do them in my social studies class on top of learning the content? Why can we not sit in a circle and listen to each other, uh-huh. you know, talk to people that don't agree with us and learn to kind of deal with those things? Because I just wanted both of you to get to a point where when you were at the point where you're at now and you get around new people, and like you said, Jacqueline, talking in your apartment the other night about music or something, or if you're talking in class over ethics, like Jack, I'm taking that you can hold your own, that you can talk to people, listen to them and, and gain that. So I love the feedback that both of you provide. I'm glad that it went well. It was not like a nightmare. And I'm glad that <laughs> both of you are willing to, to be optimistic and come back again. And, and again, you see that they're long conversations, but hopefully they seem like they go pretty fast. Mm-hmm. And, they're, and I think, that I know for a fact, there were moments tonight where either you shook me up or gave me goosebumps and it really like, open my eyes much more to songwriting. I've always had respect for musicians, especially songwriters, because it just it's one thing to even be able to play a musical instrument, but to also be able to write poetry and then make it into a song and then make it like go get because for me it's just it's just something I would never fathom myself doing. And then people will say things to me about certain things that I do and I'm just like, well it seems simple to me, whatever it is that I'm doing. But for me, what both of you do is for me like saying, hey, climb Mount Everest. That would be like (laughs) what it would be for me. So it just means a lot. And if even one listener gets something out of this, uh, which I definitely think that they will, I think that that means a lot to me to do this. I know it's a random episode. If you went down, I don't know if either one of you have looked at my my episodes, but they Mm -hmm. are very random. Like I just kind (laughs) of hop from whatever topic I want to talk about that means a lot to me or it's interesting because it's my podcast. I'm going to talk about whatever the hell I want to talk about, <laughs> but it just means a lot to me to kind of go through those. And I like these episodes where we focus on one topic because I feel like I can get a, a deeper 
meaning from Maria and Jacqueline off of what you guys think. And here's the thing is, I also feel like I'm hearing things from both of you that I don't know if I would have heard from you in high school. You know how it is in high school with the social hierarchy. I do feel like, and Maria can agree, seniors are much more honest and open than freshmen and sophomores are. My, okay. my sophomores now, they're still a little bit too worried about who's my friend and who am I going to upset if I'm not going to be popular, blah, 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 blah. They're, they're too afraid to be more honest about things to say. And I recognize that seniors were a little bit more okay with that. I, I like that as both of you being young adults now, you're more likely going to be much more open about that. But other than that, to finish up the show, as I always say to the listeners, please keep your eyes and your mind open and be contagious. Have a wonderful night. <laughs>